Good morning. I'd like to call this Tampa City Council meeting to order. At this time, I yield to Council Member Carlson to introduce our invocation for today. Yes, sir. Great. I've got, um, thank you, sir. I've got Chris Dotson. Would you like to stand on the podium? Um, and uh, he gave us a real short bio, which I appreciate. Um, Chris is the, the, even though we could say more, Chris is the teaching pastor at South Tampa Fellowship Church. He is the husband of Rachel and dad to two kids, Rosie and Remington. He is in undergraduate and master he has a uh, undergraduate and master's in biblical theological studies and is currently working on a doctorate in theology and modern culture please stand and then we'll do the pledge of allegiance <clears throat> Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Carlson, for the uh, invitation here today. And I, I do want to say it's an honor to be here. And uh, I, I, I just want to begin uh, this year by first saying a thank you to you, y'all. Uh, I think you are in a uh, thankless profession, which means you are probably told what you are doing wrong more than uh, you are thanked for what you are doing right. Uh, and while well, should ever be a leader that is uh, above being challenged. Um, it is helpful, I think, for our souls to be told thank you. So uh, at the beginning of this year, I do want to say thank you to each of you for your service uh, to our city. Now, I want to invite you to, to pray with me. Father in heaven, uh, we begin today uh, by telling you thank you. I think it's so easy to uh, wake up each morning and just take for granted the life that you have given uh, to us. But we're, we're all people that you have made uh, with a unique purpose, and all of us are individuals that you love very deeply. So Lord, we just say thank you for today. Thank you for giving us the ability to be here right now in this moment. Thank you for the countless ways that you have blessed us, uh, even if we fail to recognize those blessings. Thank you, uh, Jesus, for living the life that we could not live, dying a death that we deserved, and rising again to prove that we could find hope and life in you. Lord, thank you for these council members and their pursuit to helping Tampa flourish. Today, as we start a brand new year, uh, we, we want to pause. Uh, we're pausing to remind ourselves that our wisdom is not enough. We're pausing to remind ourselves that uh, our efforts are always going to fall short without your blessing. And we're pausing to remind ourselves that, Jesus, we need you this year. We need you to grant us wisdom where we are foolish, uh, courage where we are fearful, and humility where pride seeps in. Everybody in this room is called to be a leader, and Jesus, you showed us the best way to be a leader is by first being a servant. So give us the grace to serve our city, to serve everyone, from those who are like us to those who differ, to those we get along with and those with whom we disagree, and to those we know and those we are yet to meet. Lord, bless our efforts this year, beginning with this meeting today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Carlson? Here. Hertek? Here. Clendenin? Here. Henderson? Vieira? Miranda? Meniscalco? Here. We have a physical quorum. All right. May I have a motion to adopt the minutes from the December 21st, 2023 meeting? We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda. Do we have a second? Second from Councilmember Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. I'm going to go over uh, some housekeeping on the agenda. I received a memo from Councilmember Henderson, who will be absent today due to personal reasons. I have this memo to submit. Here we go. Motion to receive and follow. So, motion from. So Councilmember Hertex, Member Councilmember Miranda, all in favor? Aye. All right. Councilmember uh, Vieira, you're going to remove items number one and two, is that correct? Yes, sir. If I may, uh, the uh, officer of the month couldn't be here today, unfortunately, and um, the um, fire item has also been requested to be moved. So if I may, I motion for that. All right. Mm. Motion from Councilmember Vieira, Member Councilmember Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Mm -hmm. Item number 39 on the consent agenda will be heard first after public comment. Just, uh, so moved. All right, we have a motion from Councilmember Hertag, second from Councilmember Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then after <clears throat> item number 39, we are going to take a walk on to be heard right after that. Okay. Yes. Um, on the walk on, um, um, I, I, the public has not heard about what we're going to be walking on. 
and um, I'm, it, it refers to the firefighters, and I 100% support our firefighters, but I object to the process that was used to, to put this in in a way that has not provided transparency to the public. Um, this agreement has been discussed for, ver for several months, and it was recommended to the firefighters that it be walked on as far back as December. And um, I, I would like, before we agree to put it on the agenda, I would like the administration just to explain to the public why, and council, why, uh, why this was being walked on rather than, um, than having it publicly disclosed in the agenda and, um, and having backup. We, got, we received the backup, city council received the backup yesterday afternoon. The public has not received the backup, most likely at all when this could have we could have voted in December to put this on the agenda so I just not to talk about the substance of the pro project but I before you agree to put something that's a multi-million dollar contract on the cons on the um, agenda uh, without public oversight I'd like the the administration just to explain why they are proposing doing that chief Bennett and may I before yes, as the maker and thank you and, and I think I actually would be a person to respond to that inquiry as the person as the chair of the public safety committee who made the request for this this is something that was recently agreed upon by uh, Tampa firefighter 754 and part of my voice by the way I got over COVID a few days ago so uh, not the best a negative by the way negative of course um, but uh, this was brought to my attention that an agreement was executed and that today would be the day in which the uh, Tampa firefighters would like to have this done why is that because because next week we have the CRA, then we have evening council, not the best time to take something up. Thereafter, the firefighters are gonna be gone at a convention. Therefore, this would be the best day. We have had a number of walk-ons come through Tampa City Council, uh, the most recent being in CRA in <coughs> September, where two days before uh, we voted on it, there was a walk-on with backup materials given. Uh, two days before this, we received one day before on an expansion of the, strat the $25 million stress center um, agreement. I did not object to that walk on, even though I ultimately uh, voted against that, by the way. So again, for me, the procedure is fine. We're gonna be hearing about this. We did get backup materials on this yesterday, but I think this is something that we can all support. Um, and so that's why I did the memo. I think it's the right thing to do because these men and women wanna get paid sooner rather than later. And if we wait, we will end up doing this during the evening council. Uh, as opposed to doing it today when we can get it through and do the right thing for something by the way again no nobody here including councilman Carlson is uh, has any animus to firefighters of course so this is a matter of procedure as opposed to substance but as the maker of the motion in the memo uh, I think that uh, the explanation is warranted good councilman Miranda thank you chairman uh, I'm looking at it a different way I, I see that there's walk on from time to time and what I like to in order to have better transparency and better understanding of what's going on on a daily basis and the public be well aware of it. I would like every walk-on come with a number. You know, we just have walk-ons and they don't have a number. So I want to know how many walk-ons and how many tens of thousands of things we had to do the year so that we know this is the first time or the second time or the 50th time or the 100th time that there's a walk-on brought on not only by this administration but any other administration henceforth. So that way we and the public can understand exactly how many walk-ons compared to the ratio of <coughs> items that we have. I appreciate that. If somehow the chair can work with the administration and getting these walk-ons numbered. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I hate to put that burden on you, sure. but you are the leader. Mr. Uh, Chair. Chief Bennett, do you want to speak now or do you want to wait till the item comes up? Mr. Chair, I requested that he speak. Um, the, uh, I, I'm going to make a motion in new business to try to prevent walk-ons, especially at high dollar amounts. Uh, because I think the public deserves to uh, have full view and transparency on this, but I would I would just like the administration to officially state why they um, why they thought it was necessary um, in December to not allow a city council to put this on the agenda and instead have it be a walk on today. Chief Bennett, Chief Bennett, Chief Bennett. Good morning, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff, and good morning to our public. Um, it's a great question, Councilman Carlson. We, we received information that the vote off of the tentative agreements um, was handled by the union on January 5th of this year, which was last Friday. <clears throat> um, I don't recall ever being in, in a position to be able to say that there would be a walk-on as opposed to regular agenda until that vote happens. We don't get involved in their voting process that's a process that is time and distance based on their scheduling. When that came to the administration's attention on that Friday, I was out of town and on Monday, we tried to put things into action to allow council to have an informed decision. 
to answer um, Councilman Miranda's questions, I did look back at these because they are concerning. We don't want walk-ons for the public. We want things to go through the natural agenda process. But it is a fact that the only driver here is to meet a payroll timeline for firefighters because this has been an elongated negotiation. There has been 11 public meetings, publicly noticed meetings over this negotiation with fire starting back to July. So anybody from the public could have joined in those meetings during the negotiations, but there was 11 public. This will be the 12th public uh, meeting over this negotiation process. So we felt it was reasonable to put the package together, let council decide whether they want to allow the walk on or not, which would then create other continuance opportunities. And then we could also get into the merits of the contract which I am told from the chief financial officer was, is in the space of the current budget. So we obviously consider the budget issues, uh, the amount of this amendment to this contract that's already pre-existing, which is really just an amendment, is uh, a little over a million dollars over the life of this contract uh, for this fiscal year, I should say. And it is what we consider within the margins of error of the budgets already approved, which means we may never have to bring a budget amendment back to council. So it is a consent grade item. We just make sure that we, uh, on a walk on, that we have a full conversation about it. If I could, you want to close it out? Sure. Yeah, just two final questions. Um, sure. Do you, don't you think it would have been better in December to put it on the, we're getting echo, on the agenda subject to uh, approval by the union? And again, I don't object to the, understand. the, the, the contents of this, and, and I you know, fu fully support the, the, the firefighters and, and the union. My, my problem is about process. Wouldn't it have been better to put it on the agenda in December, have city council vote on it, so that it would have been on the agenda, publicly noticed? And then why, if it was approved on Friday, why would we not have got, why would at least city council not have gotten the documents until yesterday afternoon? And why was it not posted to on base so that the public could see the documents? Both great questions. Um, the on base window closes, of course, for the agenda, the final draft. Uh, we try and get everything in by Thursday before. I got this letter from the union about their vote on that Friday morning a day later. Again, I was out of town on a, uh, a family friend emergency. Um, to build the resolution with legal took a day. To make sure we put out briefing notices to council took part of that day to effectuate those briefings to give council some understanding. And also, we had to go back and make sure that the financials were in those margins so we knew that it was within the relevance of not needing a budget amendment, which again, kinds of makes it a consent grade item. To the answer about December, you know, that's something I think we can discuss. And I'll tell you, this was a, a subjective move. Once the tentative agreements were, were fulfilled with the negotiations, again, after 11 meetings, I will take responsibility for the fact that I think the union deserves the right to, to get that vote done without interference of the administration. So if I bring it forward, I don't, I don't begrudge the union to bring that forward that they have an agreement. I think if the administration brings that forward, we have a tentative agreement. Even though they're all done in the sunshine, then that's pre, preempting the voting process. And if that's bad judgment, then that's something we can learn from going forward. But I feel like the union could have come in and said we re reached an end of agreement in December, but we're not going to build the resolution <coughs> until the vote happens because we don't want to influence the voting process <coughs> for the membership. Okay, so we'll hear the walk on after item number 39 and we'll vote it up or down. Thank you very much, sir. Do I have a motion for the walk on? It'll be part of the addendum to the agenda. Huh? That was your memo with your request. If you could do it as, a, as a, the motion, that would Yeah, if I may. And I, I see Mr. Stocko, did you want to say anything? I mean, just, I don't want to. No, let's wait till, the, I mean, take the maybe. vote first. Did. Okay, well, um, I, and, I, and again, and uh, I'll, I'll make the motion, if I may, for that, to have this as a walk-on. Um, and again, the, I was called by uh, Mr. Stocko, I believe it was on Friday, when I was uh, sick, in fact, with COVID, and uh, they called me uh, because that's when the time is ripe, as uh, Chief of Staff Bennett said, when their union was able to execute and authorize and support the agreement is when the time is ripe and then the next city council meeting is today. So I think the only error would be on our part is, is uh, to not have this heard today. Uh, so I make the motion if I may. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira. Do we have a second? This is to uh, put the walk on on the agenda. Second. Second from Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I just make it? Yes. Yeah, I just want to say I fully support, support the firefighters. This decision is not by Councilman Vieira and it's not by City Council. Uh, the lack of transparency is between the administration 
um, and, and the firefighters union. The administration should have handled this in a different way. And I, I vote yes to put this on the agenda, but I would like the administration to keep the public in mind. The public deserves transparency and accountability. And so in the future, we need to provide uh, oversight for the public. <laughs> Thank you. And yes. All right. All in favor? Uh, uh, yes. yes. Point sir. and counterpoint. I just heard something that is contradictory to what I just heard again. I just to Mr. It. Bennett. Was this ever at any time published anywhere for the public to be aware of it? That's a very important question mm. for me. Mm. Good morning again, John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Other than the 11 meetings that were publicly noticed mm. for the negotiation yes, with the Fire Department's union, which started in July and ended in December, those 11 meetings were publicly noticed, which was the progressive process to get where we are. As far as this being noticed, I'd have to defer to legal, but we put the memo out yesterday and how that gets into on-base and public awareness would be the 12th and, item. And just for clarity of my own mind, those 11 that you mentioned that were publicly noticed, how were they done? I'll have to defer to the legal process. I for want to that. make sure that I'm clear at all. Yeah. Rebecca Johns, legal department. Those meetings, as with any meeting of union, um, any public meeting of the union and the administration, are published on the website. And I'm not certain if they're put in the newspapers like some other public notices, but they are put on their website and they're distributed to all of the union members. That's the city's website. Yes. I want to identify. Now, th there may be another. It may be published. I don't know. Um, HR would really know the answer to that question. But it was on the city website. The same thing. They can get any information regarding zonings and all that. The same one? Correct. Thank you. All right. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira. We have a second from Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. All right. I'm going to go through staff reports one by one. Administration update. Yes. I think we have uh, Nicole Travis yes. on standby for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Item number 76. Uh, would you like staff present for 76? I think we have to because of the monetary amount, maybe not. We don't have to but because there's a memo, but if you would like somebody, would you like somebody no. for 76? All right. No staff then? No staff for 76. Item 77, do we need staff? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah no, it's I'm all, at it's 78. All okay. Oh, 78. So this is a, any staff for 77 then? No. All right. No, no for 77. Item number 78. Eight? Yes. 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 Item number 79. Yes. All right. We will have somebody from the budget office. Item number 80, there's a request to continue 80 until uh, February 15th. May I have a motion to continue? So moved. Motion from Council Member Hertak, Senator Council Member uh, mm -hmm. all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, item number 81. Um, this is a motion by Councilman Vieira. There's a memo. Would you like? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll I'll speak to Mr. Mulkey about this offline, and I may bring this back. My my intent with this is to have a, a, a special summer camp for kids with intellectual disabilities, and and I don't want to uh, take up Council's time today further on. Obviously, a very important topic, but we got a heavy mm -hmm. agenda, so we can just the report is fine. All right. So no on number 81. How about on number 82? Um, staff to. <clears throat> Um, yeah, let's let's have somebody here, please, okay. for that. Item number 83. And, and if I yes, may, on, and I'm sorry, on 82, during the break, I'll reach out to Miss Wynn, and I may uh, just have the, yeah. So I'll, that, for now, it's yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Item number 83. And again, uh, Council, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. The 82, yes. 82 is yes. Yes. Uh, 83, we have a memo mm -hmm. from Mr. Massey. Do we need somebody present? If I may, since Councilwoman Henderson's not here today, maybe we can inquire with her aide. Um, offline on what her wishes with this would be if it should be continued or all right so we'll we'll wait because this will come up after lunch mm -hmm. item number 84 yes, uh, if we could um, move them up to first under staff reports because this was had to be continued last time because the meeting went so long they mm -hmm. had to leave so all right so we'll have yes and first all right uh, under staff reports item number 85 do we need somebody uh, here for 85? Yes, if they have something to present. All right. There's a previously submitted memo, but we say yes for 85. 86. 
This is also Council Member Henderson's memo, but. There is a memo from Mr. Massey. Do you want me to inquire with their office and yeah. we'll figure it out yeah. after lunch? Okay, item number 87, there's a request to continue to March 7th. Oops. We have a motion Second. to continue to March 7th. Item number 87, motion from Council Member Hertex and Council Member Miranda, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, item number 88, continue to March 7th. May I have a motion from Councilman so McDenna? We have a second from Councilman Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number 89 to be continued to April 25th. We have a motion from Council Member okay. Vieira, second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the agenda and the addendum? So moved. Motion from Council Member Clendenin, <coughs> second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Item number three is FDOT. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. Uh, with regard to public comment? Oh, we're oh, 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 we not there yet. Yeah, okay. Let's be public comment. Okay. Yeah. Item number Over three is FDOT to present. Uh, we have a PowerPoint. Do we have anybody from F. Dot here to present? Item number three, come on up. And if there is a PowerPoint, they will bring it up shortly. Good morning, sir. What's your name? Good morning. My name is Craig Fox. I'm a part of the Department of Transportation. Uh, happy to be here. Right. The presentation should be coming right up. Not a problem. All right. Do you want to begin with anything else? Um, to tell us if they like oh, okay, okay. They're, they're just having a, okay. Just a moment. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, so this is to update um, uh, City Council and the public on the status of the Fowler Avenue urban corridor improvements. Uh, the limits of this project are from Florida Avenue to the west, all the way east past the University Mall, past USF to 56th Street uh, towards the east. Uh, we had some very exciting changes uh, that we're looking to implement with this project in, in conjunction with uh, HART, and just wanted to update you all on the status of that project. Um, I'm actually standing in place of the design project manager, Kevin Lee. Um, his contact information is on the paper, in case you're wondering why there's two different names um, with this. So, Do you have a HART copy of it? I do, right here. Then you can put it on the Elmo, okay. and that will work as well. Perfect. Oh, wait. Oh, oh sorry. I'm up there waiting for the... Thank you. All right. So, if somebody can help him zoom out, figure it out. Yeah, I just figured out it. There you go. All right, go ahead. Sir. Okay, that'll work. Uh, we'll All right, so uh, a large driver of this project is to, of course, increase safety along the corridor. Um, like I mentioned, the limits are from Florida Avenue to the west, east of 56th Street uh, to the east. Over the five-year period from 20, between 2015 and 2019, there were a total of 3,300 crashes, crashes along the corridor. That includes all types of crashes. Uh, there were also 120 bicycle and pedestrian crashes uh, with nine unfortunate fatalities. Um, and those nine fatalities were all uh, bike and pedestrian crashes along the corridor. Uh, the image on the bottom shows where the 120 uh, bike and pedestrian crashes occurred in the corridor. You see that there's a heavy concentration right there between Nebraska Avenue and Bruce B. Downs Boulevard, and those accounted for 73% of the bike ped crashes. So that's really the hot spot on the corridor. Uh, so this next slide shows the existing pedestrian uh, infrastructure along, uh, well, pedestrian crossings. Uh, along the corridor. Right now we're just looking between Nebraska Avenue to the west and Bruce B. Downs Boulevard to the east. You'll notice that the signals are about half a mile apart, uh, which, you know, if you're a pedestrian, that's a pretty uh, long distance to walk uh, if you want to reach a, a safe crossing. And so the existing crosswalks are shown there in red. And the next slide will show where we intend to do some improvements. So in yellow, we have proposed crosswalks. Those are mid-block pedestrian signals, uh, much like the ones that you see on Hillsborough Avenue, also along Bush Boulevard, those uh, pedestrian hybrid beacons. So those are shown in yellow. And then we also have, uh, we're also working with um, some developers that are developing along the corridor, and they're looking to include some signals uh, shown there in blue. So it's going to reduce the crossing distance from around half a mile to, uh, to just around 700 feet, uh, for the most part, between that high crash corridor. 
Next, we're looking at the corridor improvements. Uh, this is, again, just between Nebraska Avenue and Bruce B. Downs. Uh, you may, may remember that we were looking at three different alternatives along the corridor, and the selected one was a business access transit alternative, and that's the one that's shown in this image. Uh, that it does include what we call a business access transit lane, and basically what it does, it allows vehicles to make right turns into businesses, and uh, but... <laughs> but uh, common vehicles cannot go through the intersection. So that leaves the through movements just to the transit, which increases the efficiency of the transit uh, pretty well. We have done this within Tampa Bay region. It's right now, that's part of the Sunrunner project, WPSTA, um, and that's been uh, very successful. And even after that project's been implemented, there's some significant safety improvements uh, without really delaying traffic that much along the corridor. So it's been really successful. So we're working closely with HART. Uh, HART is right now, they're currently going after some grants uh, to be able to implement the service along the corridor. So we're not sure, unfortunately we're not sure at the moment whether we'll be able to actually build and stripe out that lane, but we are gonna make the other bike pad improvements. So we're gonna widen out the sidewalks. We're gonna do those uh, crossings no matter what. And then if we just have to come back in, do a quick striping job, it's easy. You got both of the work out of the way and you can quickly implement it. We're also gonna build the bus pads uh, for HART uh, even though that whether they're ready or not so we can as soon as they're ready we can turn on as fast as possible and I want, do want to note that even though this is the selected alternative we we're not preventing the, say the median guideway alternative from happening in the future so depending on how the region changes that can still be implemented and this project is not going to stop that from happening uh, right now the current posted speed is 45 miles a lot, an hour along the corridor and we have a long-term uh, target speed of 35 miles along uh, that corridor Next, we're going to move further east to Bruce B. Downs Boulevard and between, so between Bruce B. Downs Boulevard, Boulevard and 56th Street. This is outside of the transit uh, corridor because at Bruce B. Downs Boulevard, the bus is going to go north, so that's why we don't have the bus lane on here. But we are going to do a resurfacing uh, within this section. We're also going to add a wider sidewalk on the north side of the roadway. Uh, that's going to connect to Peninsula Future Trail and uh, that's going to extend into Temple Terrace. Uh, the speed along the corridor is 50 miles an hour with a long-term goal of 40 miles an hour. And one thing that this uh, resurfacing project will do is to reduce uh, uh, the lane width along the corridor, which does help to in in encourage slower speeds along the corridor. And we're also continuing to work with the University of Florida along with HART to provide uh, transit access and also bike pet access. So the project schedule, uh, we are scoping out the design right now, so we're going to execute it uh, this quarter, 2024. Uh, currently, construction funds are in the second quarter of 2027. Of course, if we get any chance to accelerate and advance those funds, we will go ahead and take it. So, you know, hopefully it won't take that long, but that's currently where the funding is. So that's what we have to deal with. And like I mentioned, my name is not Kevin Lee, but he is the design project manager. You just couldn't make it here today. So his contact information is on the screen. And just a uh, safety reminder, we just whether you get there early on time or a little late, we just want everybody to get there safe to so just sort of just watch your speed and um, drive safely. Councilman Miranda, Councilman Vieira, Councilwoman Herton. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your presentation. To point to the right to it. And uh, talked about 3,320, 120 crashes and so forth and so on. How many of these are related to people that are inebriated on drugs or whatever? Uh, with, uh, also, when you have that, I would imagine you have speed. And the reason for that is you just looked at the day or two ago when some individual lost their life walking on a sidewalk on Dale Mabry in front of a very popular restaurant. I'm not going to name the restaurant because the restaurant wasn't at fault. It's somebody walking the street, somebody half goofy in the head for whatever reason, one reason or another. Maybe he just had a lot of problems on his mind or whatever and he hit somebody and killed somebody on a sidewalk mm -hmm. yeah. and and uh, so I don't I understand we talked about speed and more and more and lowering the speed and making it nicer and more projected where you can see things and the public can see you clear but how many of these are caused by something other than natural in mm -hmm. other words you're speeding that's unnatural you're on drugs that's certainly unnatural you're whatever it is and do you have a, a any calculation of knowledge of all that so so we do have that within the crash reports i just don't have that information readily available so we can certainly get back to you um with that information but but as you can see yeah we do have a pretty high concentration especially around 15th and what we notice most of the times is, is folks just just you know just, just trying to get a, get across the street um sometimes they'll cross at the intersection sometimes some folks 
although it's not the right way to cross, sometimes they feel safe for crossing away from the intersection, but then nobody expects you, and then that runs into issues. And so, some of those things are caused because you have a vehicle in front of you, you can't see the passenger walking, and you yeah. think you're all right, and you all of a sudden eat at the same point. Is yeah. there any way you can give us that information in the yeah, future? Yeah, yeah, sure. I sure, appreciate sure. We can pull up on the crash reports and we can certainly get back Thank to you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Councilman Vieira, Councilmember Hurtin. Thank you very much, and just thank you so much for your presentation, sir. We really appreciate you. You know, on some of these improvements, especially near the Terrace Park area and 56 near uh, Temple Terrace, I'd love to reach out to your office um, for maybe have somebody come and talk to uh, some of the good folks at Terrace Park. There, uh, I was just talking yesterday evening to somebody at their uh, community uh, uh, neighborhood association. And, and so we'll reach out if we may, because I think these are great improvements because the residents there, and including in Bruce B. Downs in New Tampa, uh, they, they, these statistics and these facts that you speak of, they know full well, obviously living day to day, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the danger zone, so to speak, uh, that is out there. And it's great to see these improvements and, uh, and whatnot. And these call for, for you know, continued robust investments. And this is for me, and obviously out of your, uh, there's more of a political issue, but this just screams out again why we need more revenue and a robust revenue source for mass transit, for uh, pedestrian and, and sidewalk improvements here in the county. And I know we've you know, voted on that a few times and it continues to get through one reason or another taken away from the public. And, um, but, but we do appreciate the FDOT investments. And as a side note, uh, serving on the heart board, obviously we appreciate. You mentioned heart a few times. We appreciate the the recent study uh, that y'all did on the uh, just the future of heart and different things that can happen. And I know we always look forward to working with Tallahassee and FDOT to see how we can improve heart for transparency because heart um, is just such a pivotal part of the future of transportation and mass transit here in Hillsborough County and Tampa is such a lifeline and a godsend to so many families here in Tampa and Hillsborough County. But again, <laughs> these statistics that you're talking about and the things that you're doing to address them are, are wonderful. And I'd love to, you know, get, get a report before the affected communities on that so okay. that they can see that these robust steps are being taken. So again, we thank you for your time and, and for your service to Florida. All right, thank you. And yeah, we'll reach out to your office regarding a meeting with uh, I also want to thank you for this. Um, I'm really appreciative of, of how FDOT is now uh, is doing a lot of focusing on pedestrian and cyclist crashes. Uh, I noticed that you mentioned that the, the long-term target speed will be going down. What does long-term mean? How long will it take to get to the targeted speed goal of 35 miles an hour? So, so unfortunately, right now we, we don't know. Um, that can depend on any kind of number of factors. Um, so, of course, right now the the alternative that's selected is the business access transit one. Uh, if there was, you know, another alternative that's implemented in the future, um, and of course, cost is a you know a huge factor in all of this. So, if we went to um, maybe one of the different alternatives and actually change the typical section of roadways, then that would enable it to happen. The, 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 one of the main issues with Roads is that, um, yeah, we can change the posted sign to a slow speed, but that doesn't really change actual behavior. Mm -hmm. So, actually, it actually changes the physical <coughs> characteristics of the roadway. Um, so, you know, with the developing, with the area developing into more of an urbanized um, area, that, you know, the more it develops like an urban corridor, the more likely it is that we can, you know, try some out some different strategies. Uh, but the quick and dirty answer is, is right now, we just don't know when we'll be able to drop the speed that low. Um, target speeds is substitute something that's relatively um, new to the department that we're starting to implement now, and it helps us to keep us, you know, on the glide path of, of moving towards pedestrian safety instead of just, you know, continuing to just do things the way we were. So the target speed is, is, is a little bit of a, of, a, of a goal that we intend to implement, but there's not necessarily a set project, uh, unless there's immediate project available, which there isn't right now. Um, we can't really say when that'll be implemented, unfortunately. Well, thank you, because that actually goes into my next question of, while it's great that we're going to have these right lanes for bus rapid transit, um, again, it's all about behavior and how you change behavior from people not being on those roads. And I know you said that with the Sunrunner that has been successful, but unfortunately, First Ave, um, North and South and St. Pete, totally different animal, not nearly as heavily traveled as this road. Agreed. So yeah. I'm interested going forward how you're going to, what, what are the processes you're going to do to teach people to not use that as a travel lane? Oh, and so, yeah. uh, you know, going forward, I would really love to know what 
what FDOT is planning on doing when this is put together and how we're going to ramp up teaching people that a BRT lane is exact or a BAT lane is exactly that. Like you're not driving in it and because I mean we don't really have a lot of success as you said of people following the speed limit much less mm -hmm. how because this is a brand new concept for most Floridians. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would love to see maybe some data on what happened with the Sunrunner, but really for a busier street, how are we really gonna implement that uh, going forward? So thank you again for your, um, I know this, that's a, it's a long way off if we're not starting construction until 2027, mm -hmm. but it's something that I think we should think about as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, next up is item number four. Motion by Councilman Vieira. There's a memo here. Uh, do we have somebody presenting regarding the County City Apprenticeship Pilot Program? Oh, no, that was... Um... It, the memo indicated that the memo was in lieu of an appearance. So, okay. um, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to that briefly, if right. I may. Um, the, um, so this was part of an effort I began working on uh, maybe a year and a half ago with County <laughs> Commissioner Gwen Myers uh, to have a job training and apprenticeship program uh, for returning citizens, people who are exiting our prison system every year in the United States. I believe the number is three quarters of a million uh, Americans leave our prison system and within three years, two thirds of them are gonna be back in prison, which really represents a major failure I think in terms of public policy here in the United States. And so I, I working with Commissioner Myers on this uh, pilot program so that we can, you know, increase local government's investment in helping out our returning citizens, which represent all of our families. So this all together, if memory serves me right, is gonna be $400,000 uh, for year one. And this will be coming to Tampa City Council for approval. Well, there will be um, a, a formal report, which is why I didn't wanna um, have a, a duplicate efforts, I guess, if you will. So this is in addition to the um, uh, ordinance that we did, I believe it was last year, um, to have um, incentives for contractors to hire returning citizens, those who do contracts with the city of Tampa, and to ban the box. So this is a um, really good step forward in an area, and I believe, if memory serves me, that A. Brown Ministries, their secular arm, um, got the contract, which is wonderful, because, I mean, I'm a big fan of theirs, and Robert Blunt, and all the great, and the late uh, Reverend A. Brown, I actually saw him preach when I was a little kid, and uh, just wonderful people. So we'll, we'll hear more about this in detail, I think, when council approves it, so. All right. City Council, 20,000 people are dead. Why haven't you been raising our resolution? You'll have the opportunity Join to speak during public comment. You'll have the opportunity to speak during public comment. Cease fire now. Thank you. Cease fire now. 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 Cease fire now.
let's just re- play, let's just, well, let's talk about the rules. Okay. They're outside. All right. Who in? No, you're waiting until we call the meeting to order. Wait, call the meeting to order. And and who's and when? We're all set. Yeah, call the meeting. Yeah, get quiet. Too. I'd like to call this Tampa City Council meeting back to order. If we can have a roll call. Carlson. Here. Hurtat. Here. Clint Dennis. Here. Henderson. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. And Menescalco. Here. We have a physical quorum. All right, Mr. Shelby. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to bring to Council's attention and to the public's attention the rules of procedure for the conduct of City Council, Rule 5, Public Participation. And I'm going to be re- re- reading Rules uh, 5E, 5F, 5G and 5H, all persons shall at all times conduct themselves in accordance with council's rules. Persons failing to do so shall be ruled out of order and may be directed at the discretion of the chair to be removed from the council chamber. Such person shall not thereafter be readmitted to the council chamber or city hall during the remainder of that day's meeting. Speakers shall refrain from disruptive behavior, including making vulgar or threatening remarks. Speakers shall refrain from launching personal attacks against any city official, city staff member, or members of the public. Comments shall be directed to the council as a body and not to individual council members. No one present during a council meeting shall engage in disruptive behavior including intentionally making or causing to be made any disruptive sound or noise or displaying signs or graphics in a manner disruptive to the proceeding. The chair shall rule out of order any member of the public who shall speak without being recognized or who shall not address counsel from the podium or other established speaker area. No person shall approach the dais of the city council during meetings except council members and employees of the city unless invited by a member of council. That being said, Mr. Chairman, you properly, in my opinion, called a recess during what was disruptive to the proceeding. And council, my understanding is there are those people who may want to return. Council, uh, Mr. Chairman, you did not specifically rule them out of order at that time. But that being said, how does council wish to proceed? Does council wish to have them return if they do not engage in re- disruptive behavior and if they comply with council's rules of procedure? What's the pleasure of council? I'll speak. I mean, I don't see how we can have them return today. I'm just being honest. I, I, I don't see how we can. They, they've interrupted Tampa City Council, but welcome to return in another time. It would be foreseeable that that would be their intent for the remainder of the meeting. My only concern is for the police officers who are here and putting them in that position, but I, I, that's me. Councilman Moran. I mean, you're the one that, you're the attorney, you're the one that's yes. the opinion. <laughs> yes. Whether they meet the criteria or not, not I, or not the other council members. It's. It's ultimately the chairs, according to the rules, so based on- And I agree with Mr. Vieira. Then if that's the case, Mr. Chairman, if it's your, I'm sorry, wait, you haven't wait, heard from have anyone. Council Member Clendenin. You know, I would actually say, um, reference the rule, because I am a stickler for rules, and reference the rules, I, I believe that we should uh, allow the speakers to re-enter the chamber, but understanding that if they return to the chamber and they're disruptive, that we will be trespassed from this chamber. And that would be my that would be my, uh, my my assumption. So you know, as long as everybody conforms to the rules, and uh, which you know, this is this is a government body of rules, and if they conform to the rules, they, are, they can come back in and they can speak during public comment and have their three minutes. But uh, you know, we, we would trespass if, if if they're disruptive again, they'd be trespassed. Councilman Um I agree with Councilmember Clendenin. Um, I think that uh, you know, we didn't. We didn't call them out of order, so we should invite them back. And if they can follow the rules, stay. If not, then we call them out of order. All right, Councilman Carlson, anything? No? All right. I, people will have the opportunity to speak. They'll have their three minutes. Everybody has the opportunity to speak, and we're here to listen. So I would say that 
that they should come back in as long as they respect the rules. If not, I will call folks out of order, and it is what it is at that point. Mr. Chair, I, yes. I think it would be worth, it, it, since if they're coming back, since they haven't had the benefit of hearing the rules, we might want to have them read them again. I don't know if they could hear them. Yeah. All right. Um, yes. That's fine. I mean, we're, we're, a, we're a forum where we allow, um, we believe in free speech, and we allow people to talk about things. Most government agencies only allow people to speak to the agenda. And most government agencies only allow citizens of a of a of that government agency. We allow f uh, a, a far-reaching ability of free speech. So we end up being the forum for issues that are not related to the city. But we, because we believe in free speech, we allow that. We just ask everybody to be respectful of other folks' time. There are other people here to speak on other topics and be respectful of the public watching. Thank you. Yes. And Mr. Chairman, there are a limited number of seats now in the chambers. So. People need to know that if the chambers are full, there is overflow space on the second floor where they should go to be able to see and hear the meeting until they are called up. Once this room fills up, if they had left before and they had a seat and it's no longer available, they will have to wait their turn on the second floor. Is that, is that understandable? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then I just wanted to say that uh, uh, Councilman Vieira was still in the middle of item four, so while people are coming back in, mm -hmm. if we could finish item four, that, that'd yes, be awesome before four. public and, and Yes, and, and yes, ma'am, and thank you for that, Councilman Hurtak. And if I may, um, I do know we have people, a lot of people in the room. One thing I would suggest, Mr. Chair, and again, like the issue before it lies with you, is that the people who are here right now be given the chance to speak first uh, because they didn't cause this delay. Uh, and I know people are on schedules, et cetera, regardless of what the, the substance that they're here to speak for. And I, I have I think uh, that's five registered right. speakers, so I'm mm -hmm. going to go with the registered speakers. Yes, sir, and I defer to you, Mr. Chair, as always. Right. Thank Anything you, sir. Anything else? No, sir, thank you. All right. Uh -huh. yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll at least start with the virtual public comment, and then those five are done. You know, the folks will be here. You can read the rules again. After Council Member Vieira's uh, the discussion, do you finish your item? And, and if, if I may, Mr. Chair, yes. And I think Councilman Hurtak wanted to speak on it, so obviously. I just, I just wanted oh. to finish. Oh, okay. No. Well, th how, thank you very much. You're kind as always. Yeah, no, I, I, I have nothing. I mean, again, when, when this comes up before us on a vote, we can deal with it more in depth then. But th again, this is, but before we were interrupted, a really, really good program for the city of Tampa that I think we should all be proud of on an issue that is uh, very, very ignored and, and it affects all of our families returning citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have, yes? Um, can I sp speak before public comment just quickly? We have the registered speakers. You want to speak now yeah. or do you want to wait? Um, I do, um, just because I want to, um, I know a lot of people are here to talk about King State, and one of the things that council can't do is communicate during our public comment. So I wanted to tell folks what I have been working on before we get started with public comment, and just uh, Mr. Shelby will let you know that we can't respond during. Um, I have been working with Brad Baird and the um, water department on the issue. I uh, got them to add more signage to the road to help figure out how to get in. I've asked them to do a map. I don't know if that's going to happen yet. Uh, and the other thing that we're working on, we have a brand new director of contracts who's been working on starting a contractor grading system that will help prevent these issues in the future also to require better communication with businesses. So just wanted to let you know that we have been working behind the scenes on some things. It doesn't mean it's perfect, doesn't mean it's okay, but I wanted to let you know where we are with that right now. Those signs should be up tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, just to the King State issue real fast, uh, so the public knows, City Council is limited in what we can do in situations like that. Um, we can, once we approve administrators, we can't remove them. We, they don't report to us, they report to the mayor. And so if they don't perform in the way that we or the public like, city council can ask them to report to us, but ultimately it's the mayor's responsibility to oversee them. The same thing with, um, with contractors. If contractors do not uh, fulfill the needs of the community or do something against the community, well, we cannot cancel a contract, we can only approve them. And so if the same contractors come back again after having disrupted the community, we can choose to not vote for their contracts again. Uh, as uh, Council uh, Woman Hurtak has said, uh, we also have asked for four years for reform of contract administration, which is a group that oversees uh, these kinds of contracts. And 
uh, the administration brought in a new director a few months ago, and he's working hard to try to fulfill uh, the, the transparency and public interest uh, that we've asked them to attend. But um, I, well, I would suggest if you have issues about um, this project, address them to, to the public works or the mayor. The mayor's the one who can directly make a difference on it. Uh, we can ask people to report to us, but the mayor can change this today. Thank you. And same, I've, I've received uh, communication from, or calls from folks regarding King State and to help them out. I've called the city attorney. I've talked to, I've reached out to same uh, Mr. Baird uh, regarding, you know, risk management and what we can do and everything else. So we, we are listening. Uh, sir? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I want to thank Councilwoman Hertek for doing the work that she's done on this issue. Uh, it is unacceptable. Um, the impact that this has had on local businesses in the community in that area. So uh, thank you, Council and Hertek, for doing the, the outreach and trying to, to alleviate some of the problems. And hopefully uh, this will be a learning lesson for the city and it won't repeat. Yes, sir. I, I was just going to say the same. Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. It's a learning issue for all of us. And maybe in the future, this sets a tone of how you, when you have a road closure, how many signs you need, how you have the direction, which maybe we don't have in any orders. But, Mr. Bennett, do you have any, anything on this? I'm just asking if maybe he can address some of the items that were brought up here since he is with the administration. Good morning again, John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Good morning to the public. The only thing I can add is, first, I want to thank Council for bringing this to staff's attention, the administration. We really encourage that, that open dialogue between all people that can serve the community. But I will tell you that the mayor uh, pulled in staff as well and had a, uh, a timely conversation to Council McCarlson's point about what we need to do now and what we need to do in the future in all these situations. So thank you. Yes. And uh, yeah, and I think we've all reached out to the appropriate entities on this. And I, I wanted to just echo what other folks have said and thanking people who are here for King State. Uh, I, I, it's um, when you see a business affected uh, so adversely because of construction, it breaks your heart. It really, really does. And this is one that's obviously so loved by the community. And again, like I, I was telling somebody on the phone two days ago that, you know, our businesses have taken so many hits over the last few years. Businesses obviously still, still remember COVID and all the different challenges that that posed and businesses have gotten through so many hurdles and now here's another one. So, you know, I think that all of us are united in helping to find solutions on this. And I know Councilwoman Hertak has done a lot of good work. I forwarded one of her posts on my uh, city council uh, page saluting her work. And, uh, and I know Councilman Escalco has also done a lot of work on contractor issues in the Seminole and Tampa Heights area as well. Um, so again, when, you know, y'all who are here for that, you know, you're, you've got a council that's listening and a, and, a, and a city government that's listening. And I think we'll um, do everything that we can, but be honest about the things that we can do. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right, we have registered public comment speakers. We'll go through those first. Then Mr. Shelby will read the rules for everybody that's here. And then we'll begin with uh, in person. So Ruben Ware. Is uh, Ruben Ware online? He is not online. And next speaker, speaker will be Michael Randolph. Michael Randolph is online? All right. Mr. Randolph, if you're on, please unmute yourself and state your name. Good afternoon. Oh, actually, good morning. My name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West Tampa uh, Community Development Corporation. I do want to mention that COVID and the flu is up, so please protect yourself. That being said, I want to talk about the programs that we have coming up. The first is the grant uh, workshop on January the 17th. This particular course here is anywhere from six to eight weeks. It teaches individuals in West Tampa, especially low income individuals, how to write a grant. They can make anywhere from 20 to $200 per hour. The second thing that's coming up is the business plan workshop on January the 18th. Uh, again, this is six to eight week course especially for low-income individuals that's in West Tampa. Any individual can make anywhere from 1000 up to 5000 per grant. The next workshop is Artificial Intelligence, Chat GPT, and Web3. If you don't know by now, I'm in love with Artificial Intelligence. That's going to be on January the 19th. Honestly, it has taken my business to the next level. Then finally is the uh, workshop. It's not it's the community meeting our health public safety and economic development on January the 31st. This particular meeting looks at what's going on in New York, Chicago, Philly, and Baltimore. In Baltimore, they have reduced the violent, the murder rate by 20%. So we're looking at that model 
for uh, Tampa. In fact, there's no other mall in Florida that mimics that particular thing. The focus is going to be on hard, the hard poor that live in our community. We cannot arrest our way out of this, so we're using economic development as a strategy to change the mind. And then as a side note, we're meeting with the banks uh, this year in reference to our home-based e-commerce uh, uh, initiative. We believe that uh, waiting for the government to do reparation is just a joke. We believe in going to the banks and getting reparation by in terms of getting businesses to get started in West Tampa, especially for the low-income individual. Again, we believe reparation has to start with us. So we've been meeting with the banks to talk about how can we get, especially low-income individuals, to start their uh, business. This is a new year, a new attitude. I'm really looking forward to what's going on. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak. And thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have Charissa Stepp. They are not logged on at this time, so the next speaker will be Brent Kaysen. Brent Kaysen, if you are on, please unmute yourself and state your name. <coughs> Brent Kaysen? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. This is in relation to the um, King State. Uh, is it okay to go before any other yes, uh, go ahead. speakers or motions that they made? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your time, City Council. I'm 44 years old and I've known Nate and Tim, the owners for Key State, almost half my life. That's not the norm. Um, that's always the way it's been with their friends. They've known most authentic and hardworking people. It's come full circle with Key State as many of those decades-long friends who are masters of their own craft. They're local bartenders. They've managed in hospitality and launched bars around Tampa, are now managing the King State location. Uh, one of their sisters, who's always been an amazing kitchen, baking chef, uh, she launched the program for food. Their longtime friend who's designed their album covers and he's Grammy nominated, has done all the design and branding. It's an incredibly family-oriented business. Uh, Tim and Nate are both in successful touring bands, and I also tour and work for bands. Uh, we get to experience different areas of cities and states around the country, hitting up our favorite coffee shops or checking out new ones. Many people move away from home once they experience these places or people who have ideas to launch something like this. We'll go to a larger city. It's cooler. Maybe it's easier. We have friends who just left Tampa and launched a coffee shop in Nashville this year. These guys never wanted to leave Tampa, and they said from the get-go they wanted to do something rad in their own city to help push the progress. I remember in 2018 being on tour with Tim Stan, and after late nights of playing shows and hanging, he'd be awake before most of the road crew. He's already on phone calls with contractors talking about the shop, uh, then straight into working on his laptop, recording music, working on the show, into a fan meet and greet and a sound check, and then playing a show for an hour and a half and repeat the next day. He even flew home when he had just one day off between shows for city council meeting like this concerning King State, uh, just to get this dream launched. Despite it being friends, the shop is my favorite place in the country to hang out. I mean, how often is there a coffee shop with a bar, a killer food, and an old gas station with all the natural light? I haven't been to any to check all those boxes. Now, fortunately, because of their career and being genuine people who everyone stays friends with, they've had their friends from bands all around the country post about this to their fans to push support for King State, whether in person or their online merch store buying coffee beans. Um, and hopefully that's helped financially this week. But what about businesses facing the same hardship who may not have the support of large rock bands who played out shows, sold out shows, and have huge online presence on social media? Um, those businesses deserve for City to have their back too, which is not happening here. I'm glad the city is putting money into redesigning some roads soon with bike lanes and better structure as a cyclist myself. But if businesses like this close up because the city of Tampa and the construction company's short-sightedness, where will anyone be biking or scooting to? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Nicole Rourke. Nicole Rourke, if you're on, please unmute yourself. All right. 
Let me know if she comes back. All right, Mr. Shelby, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Martin Shelby, City Council, City Council Attorney. Members of the public are allowed a reasonable opportunity at the beginning of today's council meeting to address any item on the agenda before the City Council takes official action on an item. A three-minute time limit applies to all speakers providing public comment. Speakers and members of the public are also reminded that they are to refrain from disruptive behavior, including making vulgar or threatening remarks or making or causing disruptive noises or sounds or displaying signs or graphics. Speakers are also reminded to refrain from launching personal attacks against any city official, staff member, or members of the public. The chair will rule out of order any person who speaks without being recognized or attempts to address the city council from outside the speaker area at the podium. Persons failing to comply with the council's rules may also be ruled out of order and, at the discretion of the chair, may be removed from the chambers for the remainder of the day's meeting. If you're here to speak on an item set for public hearing, you will have that opportunity when the item is heard later in the agenda. No public comment will be taken later during staff reports. The time to speak about those items and items on the consent agenda is now during general public comment. And finally, city council members should refrain from engaging a speaker under public comment, and the public should be aware that city council does not take questions or have a dialogue during general public comment. This is your opportunity to express your position. Thank you. Thank you very much. First speaker, yes, sir. Reparations. I want that to be the first word come out my mouth for 2024 in front of this Tampa City Council. Your name, sir. Mentisnot. That means anything's possible, and I'm Iraq. And Tampa, Florida's address. I've said it before. I've said it in the past, and I'll probably say it in the future. It's a garbage city council. Each and every last one of y'all, because uh, you can't speak of you individually, so you have to speak of you collectively. It's a garbage city council. It's always been a garbage city council. It's been a garbage city council since 1855, because in the past, when I had to come here, I had to chain myself to that chair, chain myself to that chair in order to get up here and speak, in order to be able to stay in here, because they used to put black people out of here, or this black person out of here who don't toe the line like a dog, like an animal. You treat us like dirt, and they put us to the back of the bus, and that's what they're trying to do today right now with the Palestinians. They're trying to put them to the back of the bus right here live. Oh, no, like they did, they, they, they can go downstairs and they can speak last because, and y'all MFs ran a whole agenda talking about Kent State, talking about white people situations. A whole agenda outside of the agenda. But you talk about rules and regulations and decorum. But you ran a whole agenda outside and say, no, we're going to put the white people to speak first before the people that suffer in, in Palestine. 50,000 women and children mostly dead. And y'all going to put that ahead. It's a garbage city council. And this ain't no agenda. It's a menu. And when you serve up this menu, you can put anything you want to on it. You can have walk-ons. You can do whatsoever you want to do. No transparency. You can do a $109 million police building that ballooned into something else and nobody know about it. It's a menu. And when you go to the nasty restaurant and they don't like you, they can do anything when you order something off the menu. They can spin your food. They can give you the wrong food and make you like it to show you you're not welcome. And that's what y'all did today. It was hateful. It was spiteful. And it's deplorable. Somebody putting somebody out of building, but somebody announcing they got COVID a few days ago and don't have an MF and mask on. <laughs> yeah, it's a great dichotomy, and y'all have to understand it. But people aren't going to, I don't care how you're suffering, people aren't going to accept the nonsense. We're not going to accept the suffering peacefully. And grown people can't accept some people getting up and chanting for a few minutes. Got to put them out the building and call the Gestapo on them? It's more police outside than imaginable for no reason, for some peaceful citizens. Thank you very much, sir. 
Next speaker, please state your name. Good morning, Connie Burton. First, I would just like to thank uh, the councilman for talking about transparency. Because this morning, uh, getting ready to come here, it was just not talking about uh, the pay for the fire, firemen, but it's also the establishment of bonding for police, I mean, for fire station. And so I'm hoping that that is not all packaged together and we haven't had an opportunity to talk about it as a community. Because inside of our community, I wish a simple roadblock was our issues. But our issues have been swamped with years of injustice. So the issues of on item number four, the apprentice program, we want to make sure even if it's going to an African uh, facility, that it has the checks and balances. Because we've had too much money go to entities, and when we look to see what's the quality of life for people going through those programs, we see a big administrative salaries, and the people still suffering. Mm. And we don't want no more of that. Um, I like the fact item number 11 talk about children, young people with intellectual disability. I could tell you about a whole bunch of children that was given Ritalin in our community. I don't know if they would qualify. I know this is for a special group, but when we are talking about issues that's going to improve the life of young people inside of East Tampa, we want to see the same consideration. Because they are dealing with a, a boatload of issues. And item number 48. Y'all tend to want to give money because they come down and they come down with special uh, statute titles and whatever. I am very, very opposed to Salida House getting a dime. You know why? Last year, they was only able to move six people into home ownership. Mm. They have a building right now on Hillsborough Avenue that they came to the East Tampa CRA asking for $450,000 to complete their structure. If anybody needs some counseling on financial issues, it's them. Do not just give money to these organizations because they are not pushing the needles to help the progress of black people. It is not working for us. And lastly, I was totally disappointed very quickly to hear that one of the city staffers had been removed from a Saturday morning's pro program of Gregory Hart, as if that program becomes the voice for the city, it is distasteful. It is hurtful in our community because now it leads to suspicion. What the hell did he do? If the city has some announcement to make regarding anything that's going to have a direct impact on, on black people's lives, let it come from Mr. Bennett and his staff. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next speaker. Yes, sir. Good morning, City Council, members of the chamber. Good morning. The other, the other month, several months ago, Councilman presented the um, City of Tampa scorecard. And when he presented the scorecard, one of the first PowerPoints stated, what What's gets your, measured gets done. What's your name, sir? I'm sorry. My name is Daryl Heitch. Yes, sir. It stated, what gets measured gets done. And then it had a bottom subtopic that stated, why measure? In that scorecard, it had several different key metrics. Some of the key metrics were per capita income, medium household income, prop poverty rate, and many other things that was in that scorecard. I want to bring your attention to some of the things that he mentioned. The per capita income for benchmark cities was $40,962 for Tampa in comparison to Charlotte at $43,000. Um, the per capita income for third high, Tampa was the third highest major Florida city. The percent of population living in poverty in Tampa is 17.8% and for Fort Lauderdale is 15.5%. There's a disparity between African American and Caucasians, um, 31,983 for Tampa and 25,381 for St. Pete. I bring all that to your attention. <laughs> Because I think that when we put together scorecards, we put them together so that we can win, so that we can be competitive in the things that we do. And what I keep seeing and what I keep hearing is that 
you're leaving out a total population from being a part of your scorecard. See, Charlotte can win. St. Pete can win. Why? Because they have invested and put tools in place for their African-American community. Three years ago, you all were presented, and you said out your own mouth that you would consider a reconciliation com commission for res Resolution 568. All we're asking is for you to appoint and get that, that get it started. Because right now, if we call ourselves Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay, we have a scorecard that was articulated perfectly and designed, which tells me that you want to win. You have an opportunity here to win because we're sitting on the sidelines saying, hey, put us in the game, coach. Put us in the game, coach. If you put us in the game, we will help you win. But as long as you never take into consideration what you said with that reconciliation commission that was to review six bullet points that you put in place, if you never do that, then why are we taking the time putting together a scorecard? Put us in the game, coach. That's all we're asking. Put us in the game. We want to play, and you gave us the playbook. Put the commission together. That's all we're asking. Put the commission together. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next speaker, please state your name. My name is Franklin Perez. I live in Seminole and Hillsborough counties. If you have passed any pro-Israel resolutions in the past, I ask that you rescind them all. Enough is enough. Israel is a Jewish supremacist apartheid state that has been committing ethnic cleansing and human rights abuses against Palestinians for 75 plus years as per reports from reputable human rights organizations like Bethlehem, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International. And today, Israel is on trial at the Hague International Court on charges of genocide against Palestinians. Stop supporting Israel. Stop giving it weapons, stop giving it money, and condemn it for what it is, an apartheid and genocidal state. Gaza is an open-air concentration camp. The Israeli apartheid regime's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has invoked genocidal language against Palestinians in the Gaza concentration camp by referring to an ancient biblical passage in the Old Testament comparing Palestinians to the Amalekites that must all be put to death, men, women, children, babies. The Israeli apartheid regime's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, has dehumanized Palestinians by referring to Palestinians in the Gaza concentration camp as human animals. Miko Pellet, Israeli Jew, son of a famous Israeli Jew general, ex-Zionist occupation forces enforcer and Palestinian rights activist, has stated that the Israeli army is the best terrorist group in the world. Ex-Israeli Jew Zionist occupation forces pilot, Yonatan Shapira, has stated that the Israeli army is a terrorist organization run by war criminals. At this point, due to scattered Zionist-only occupier settlements in the West Bank, the only fair solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict is a one-state solution where everyone, Jew and Palestinian, has equal rights. That is what is referred to as a free Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. All U.S. government entities should be pressuring the Israeli apartheid regime to move towards such a free Palestine. That includes the dismantling of the Gaza concentration camp. The refrain that Israel has the right to self-defense is a red herring. The real question is, does Israel have the right to use force to maintain an illegal occupation and apartheid state that commits ethnic cleansing, human rights abuses, and genocide against Palestinians? The clear answer is no. Under international law, Israel has no right of self-defense when it is the oppressor and occupier, while Palestinians do have the right to physically resist and defend themselves against their oppressor and occupier, the Israeli apartheid regime. Our tax dollars should be going back to our own communities, not to support unrelenting bombing and genocide in Gaza. No more money for Israel's crimes. I request that the Tampa City Council introduce a resolution to stand with Palestinians around the world in demanding an end to the siege of Gaza, a permanent ceasefire, and an end to all U.S. aid to Israel. Military, economic, political. Ceasefire now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, my name is Lena Vu, and I'm here again to urge you to sever all ties that the city of Tampa has to the settler colonial state of Israel, um, including banning cross-training between the Tampa Police Department and the Zionist occupation forces, and also to pass a formal resolution calling for a permanent and immediate ceasefire in Palestine. 
calling for a ceasefire should not be controversial. I don't know why, but since when did saying stop the killing become such a heated topic? You know what should be controversial? Choosing, not, choosing to look away from the fact that Israel has been carpet bombing the 2.3 million people that they forced into a concentration camp. <clears throat> What's happening in Palestine is not a war, it's genocide. If you're gonna call it a war, call it a war on civilians, a war on children, or a war on journalists. Israel is not engaged in a war for its existence. It is a nuclear armed state with probably the most technologically advanced army in the world, and yet we've seen their ability to take out specific targets with direct strikes, and they are still continuing to drop unguided bombs all over Gaza, including <coughs> safe places, <clears throat> or places that they deem as safe zones. We are almost 100 days into this genocide, and over 100 journalists have been targeted and murdered. Um, yesterday, I was watching the live stream of Bissan, one of the journalists in Gaza that's thankfully still alive for now. Um, and she was talking about how some people have resorted to eating the plants. Oops, sorry. It's for class. Um, for eating plants um, or leaves on trees and drinking polluted water. So not only is the occupation bombing everything in sight, they are starving them to death. <clears throat> Um, but this should make you wonder why the occupation forces even had the ability to cut off all water and food to Gaza in the first place. The, Israel has been, <clears throat> has been breaking international law well before October 7th, and it is embarrassing that the city of Tampa has any kind of connection to the terrorist apartheid state of Israel. Um, and people are out here getting upset over a chant calling for the freedom of the Palestinian people from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea because they assume it means that we want to wipe so-called Israelis or Jewish people off the map, when in reality, the ones that are being wiped off of the earth are Palestinians and their history. Uh, people are more upset about a hypothetical genocide than the one happening right in front of us. If you still can't acknowledge it, you either have rocks for brains or you're willfully ignorant. And either way, we will remember. And there is blood on your hands and all of our hands because our tax dollars are paying for the bombs dropping on Gaza. But at least some of us are actually trying to do something about it. So free Palestine from the river to the sea. Thank you very <clears> much. <throat> Next speaker, please state your name. My name is Laura Hill. I'm a black and I'm black and Jewish. And I'm also an army veteran. The brutal bombardment of Gaza and the unjust occupation of Palestine has gone on for far too long. Over 22,000 people, or one out of 100 Palestinians in Gaza, have been murdered by the genocidal state of Israel within just the last few months. It is crucial that we continue the fight for a ceasefire in 2024 so that no more are killed. Despite international pressure, Israel continues its horrific campaign of ethnic cleansing and indiscriminate bombing. The temporary ceasefire was not enough. We must continue to fight for a permanent ceasefire in the liberation of Palestine. The cities of Seattle, Atlanta, Richmond, Oakland, Providence, uh, Kudahe, Kudahe, Akron, Wilmington, and Easton have passed resolutions calling for a ceasefire. We urge our city council to follow suit and sever all ties Tampa has to Israel. This call to action aims to increase pressure and spread awareness. We intend to flood our city council with emails and calls and pack city council meetings until our demands are met. As of four days ago, about 4% of the total population of the Gaza Strip, more than 90,000 people are dead, missing, or wounded, including those with long-term disabilities. As the genocidal war waged by Israel against them enters in fourth, its fourth consecutive month, Israel's withholding of water, food, fuel, and electricity has put the entire population at serious risk of mass deaths from famine, dehydration, and disease. Israel's continuous attacks by air, land, and sea have destroyed about 70% of the civilian facilities and infrastructure in the Gaza Strip since October 7th, with an approach of implementing collective punishment against the population in making the Strip, which has been under siege for more than 17 years, an unfit place for life, pushing hundreds of thousands of civilians towards mass forced displacement. We demand a permanent ceasefire and we will not be complicit in genocide. 
We demand the ban of TPD IOF cross trainings and the end of the Israeli Florida Business Accelerator Program. We will maintain pressure on elected officials until our demands are met. Free Palestine. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. Hello, my name is Tim McTagg, and I'm one of the owners and co-founders of King State. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you for the time. And um, I had a whole thing prepared, but I think you guys covered a lot of that. And over the last few weeks, we've had friends reach out to your offices. Ms. Hertek's been very, very uh, helpful to us. And um, I just really want to explain in detail in a very concise scenario where we're at. I think small businesses are tough. Restaurant industry is even tougher. We know that. We've gotten through COVID. We've gotten through a lot of different things. And when this construction started, you know, in September, it was a, it was a bit of a bummer. We were really looking forward to quarter four, really kind of putting the bow tie on our year. We had a really slow summer. It was the hottest summer on record. All of our food and beverage friends felt the same thing. We were all just waiting for the, re the weather to really cool off. And to the day that the weather cooled off, we had cranes and road blockage on our street. And this was different than some of the stuff that's happened throughout the city. This is four lanes, zero <coughs> thoroughfare. I'm sure you guys have seen the videos. I've already sent the city claims. I've already sent you guys videos. We don't need to rehash that. And my goal here with all of our supporters is to also not abuse your time and have this become some big filibuster where we just say the same thing over and over again. I do want to say that we do have a claim into the city and that this is much bigger than getting one lane open or having one sign saying we're open. We've lost six figures this quarter, and we just got told less than two weeks ago, finally from the city, when they finally communicated to us that the scope of work won't stop until March or April. And we hemorrhaged most of our nest egg and most of our cash flow reserves already in quarter four. And the biggest bummer of that is we're not even halfway through, and we're slowly, slowly, slowly going down to zero. Whether that means we have to restructure with a certain type of filing, take on new money, or start screwing our creditors. If the city doesn't step in and make us whole, then we have to pass that down to our staff with layoffs, trimmed hours, and our creditors. And that's not our fault, but it's now our problem. And without anyone in the city voting for our claim and making that right, that is the only path we have moving forward. And we've been here for five years. We love the city. We love the growth. We're not anti-growth, we're not anti-construction. What we are is anti-expecting a small business of our size to deal with six straight months of having their entire road blocked without any financial assistance. I know that's my time. Uh, I'd also like to say that after running the numbers for our claim, because we had to make sure that was airtight, we're actually five figures down quarter four this year or last year than we were even when we were shut down for the pandemic. So we're actually lower than the COVID 2020 quarter four. The only way us and all of our guests and friends got through that is with assistance. And that's what I'm asking you for right now. I know you can't write a check. I know you don't vote on that. But I do know that I believe you have our interest in mind. And you are our allies, not our adversaries. So I appreciate the support and advice. Thank you very much, sir. And we really need you to do that for us. And Thank you. I know we can't dialogue. I have a lot of questions. But hopefully we can recoup after that. Thank you. Lisa, the people that walked in, are they part of the 11 that were waiting downstairs? They are. Okay. I still have a few. Okay. Next speaker, please. Please state your name. <clears throat> My name is uh, Tom DeGeorge. Uh, I am a small business owner. I own Crowbar in Ybor City. Um, I recognize city council's limited power in this situation, but it's hard to get real time and a seat at the table with the mayor's office, and this is one of the best ways to uh, get message out to taxpayers and voters. Um, small businesses are the cornerstones of our community. Uh, they build up community development, construction, gentrification, corporate corporatization, and no rent protection um, are killing our small business owners, um, especially when it's done irresponsibly. Um, here's a list of outright closures or businesses that were forced to move in recent years. New World Brewery, Orpheum, Ichichoro, Mermaid, Seventh Son, Rock Brothers, Crab Devil, Parks and Rec, Ebor Art Colony, Boneyard, Smoke Signals, Fly Bar, Courtney's Cafe, London Heights, Jet City, Elmer's, Social House, Sunday's Deli, Cask, The Mill, Moats Florist, Dats, Bay Cannon, Funland Drive-In, Heights Seafood, King of the Coop, Born Free, Flocal, Napoli Pizza, 
Cox Seafood, Honeycomb Cafe, First Chance, Last Chance, White Lie, Barks to Riches, Cast Street Deli, Florida King Distillery, soon, very soon Zydeco. Um, let's not let King State be the next. Um, I strongly suggest an evaluation of the Director of Economic Opportunity, whose department includes small business navigation. Um, our sm small businesses are dying here in the city of Tampa. There, there's nowhere to go to get help. The weight is all on us. We, we, King State, when they came in there, they helped build up that community, and now they're being left out to dry because of irresponsible city decisions. Uh, but we need more. We need better. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next speaker. Uh, good morning. My name is Jason Sowell. I am one of the chaplains from the Tampa Police Department. I've stood before you guys many times in the past. Uh, I just wanted to uh, be here today and go on record in support of King State. I've known Tim and Nate, the owners, for years. Um, I run a nonprofit here in the city of Tampa that uh, many people in the city, the mayor's office included, have been a part of, the Tampa Police Department have been a part of over the years, um, helping communities all across our city. Uh, Tim and Nate are no different. They've been supporters for years. King State has been one of our supporters for uh, many years as well, as just as a uh, company, as a haven for, for people in the neighborhood, as financial supporters, as uh, volunteers within their community. Um, I know there's not a lot that City Council can do. There's some things that the Mayor's Office can do. Um, this is one of those businesses that we should be fighting for in whatever way that we can. These are people in our community that are um, not just bystanders, but they take action in our community. They get involved to do the best things that they can to help us uh, in many different ways within our community. Um, I know we always talk about what we can't do, but that's not the point of why they're here today and why everyone else is here today. The point is, what are the things that can be done? The mayor's office can do some things. City council has the ability to put pressure on the mayor's office to do some things to make this better, uh, to make it right, not just for them, but for every small business that comes after them that deals with the same issue. Um, and so on, that, on their behalf, I wanted to put my name on record in support of them and ask you and the mayor's office to do what you can to um, make this better for them and every business that comes after them that makes our city better and uh, makes our city not just better here for the people here, but on a, on a national scale as well that puts eyes on our city uh, for great things that are happening here. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, my name is Finney Cook. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of King State. I know we've um, heard a lot of information, but I might be able to add just a little slightly different perspective that I think would be uh, useful. Um, as a little background, I've lived in the Tampa Bay area my whole life, a resident of Tampa for the last 20 years. Um, I earned my master's degree and PhD in economics from the University of South Florida here in Tampa at the School of Business. I also serve on the USF Econometrics and Quantitative Economics Industry Advisory Board. Uh, I'm an economic consultant here in Tampa. Um, part of my practice involves analyzing uh, expert, I'm an expert in analyzing financial statements. Uh, for small businesses such as King State. Um, my husband and I are also investors in King State. We chose to invest in and support King State because of the culture of the company, because of the character of the owners, Nate and Tim, whom we've known for years, and because of what we thought that this great, great place would add to the city of Tampa. We made the choice to invest to support a local small business that would add something of value to the city in an area that especially needed it. Located on Florabraska near the interstate in what many would call an up and coming area. It's a cool local neighborhood spot. It offers quality products and they've developed an almost cult-like clientele that are devoted um, customers. Looking at the financial statements that I've been provided, the restaurant has experienced consistent growth year after year since 2019 in terms of its revenue and sales. That is, until the fourth quarter of 2023, when the construction on Florabraska Avenue closed all four lanes to traffic and prevented our customers from driving to King State and even gave the appearance that the restaurant might be closed. This was the worst fourth quarter of revenue that King State has seen since 2019, even worse than the 2020 COVID year. This is obviously not sustainable. The purpose of my being here today is simply to ask you, City Council, to do whatever is in, within your power to help alleviate this construction situation 
to allow our customers to come back to the restaurant and to allow them to know that we are open and provide vehicle access to King State. In my opinion, in order to continue to foster local investment in small businesses in Tampa, we need to be able to instill investor confidence that such businesses have the support of the city and have a chance of long-term success. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Next speaker, please state your name. Good morning, City Council. My name is Justin Rickey. I'm resident 103 East 26th Avenue in Tampa Heights, former board president of the Tampa Heights Civic Association, current board member of the Tampa Heights Riverfront CAC. Um, I'm here to speak on, on behalf of supporting this business. I think that um, by saying that nothing can be done by city council isn't necessarily true. I think that I would urge city council to kind of look at some of the processes behind what happens to a business when we have these capital improvement projects. It really does because <coughs> I've seen, and if you live in the Heights, you saw it happen up on Central with uh, where health might used to be in that little corridor. And if you've lived in the Heights as long as I have, you've known that our neighborhoods have struggled for this small business. So when we get partners like King State in our neighborhood that are willing to make an investment, to me, that's a big deal. I'll, I'll fight tooth and nail for that every day, every day, right? So we have people that are investing in our neighborhood. It's crucial to me that we keep these people here, if we can, right? So I urge you, please, look at the process. Find out where we can improve, because I think we can do better as a city to serve our small businesses during these capital improvement projects. Um, it, it, really is, it really is a big, it's, it's a huge deal. I, I don't, I don't want to lose this business in my neighborhood. They've been a vital community partner. They've helped us with neighborhood cleanups. They've helped support the Junior Civic Association. They've given back to a community. You see a lot of people, they just come in, they do their business, they leave. You got, these guys have supported our neighborhood, and so I'm here to support them back. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, um, Councilwoman Hertek. You, you've been amazing. I really appreciate all your help and support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Lisa. Do we have more people coming up to speak? I can go ahead now. I think you still have some in the audience. I think that just have not got up okay. and gotten in line as well. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Please. Good morning, Council. My name is uh, Nate Siegel, um, resident of 4007 Swan Avenue. I'm a local business owner as well here in support of King State. Uh, I'm a partner at a similar restaurant called Willis, not far from here. And wanted, uh, while echoing a lot of the comments for, that were proceeding here, I uh, wanted to kind of share just the experience that we had over uh, on our development along Rome Avenue during the Cypress Street <coughs> corridor improvements, which is the same exact thing going on over at um, on Florida, Nebraska. The big difference that we experienced um, of our road being closed for more than a year um, was at least clear communication and an excessively um, aggressive. Uh, construction plan from the developer that was doing the work from Woodruff. Uh, they had a clear uh, line of communication that was really critical for us to understand what was going on and, and when it was being done and workers were two or three shifts a day to get things done uh, because this work was really important for, for the neighborhood as it is over on Florida, Nebraska. Um, and a number of uh, our neighbors over on Cass Street did close, that uh, was mentioned previously. Uh, King State needs help. Uh, they are just an example of how this is uh, detrimental to the community, even though a lot of this work is really important for the improvements of the infrastructure. It shouldn't be at the uh, detriment to the businesses, which then obviously hurt the city with lower tax revenues as well. Uh, so encouraging the city and the mayor's office to select uh, construction companies that are more responsible, more engaged to their community, especially business leaders, um, to make things not, not hurt so much uh, is, is, I think, the, uh, the solution here. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, my name is Matt Levine. Um, I'm a local Jewish American. Um, I'm here to speak uh, against the genocide going on in Palestine right now. Um, we need the city of Tampa to end its complicity with Israel. Israel's doing this with the full backing of the United States. Um, they've bombed hospitals, schools, universities. They blew up every bakery in Gaza. Um, 30,000 people are dead. Just as many people are injured. People are missing under the rubble. Uh, we need the city of Tampa to pass a resolution for a ceasefire and to end the arming of Israel. Uh, 
We need you to end your involvement with the Florida Israel Business Accelerator. We need to end police cross trainings with the between the Tampa Police Department and the Israeli Occupation Forces. We know that they, through the deadly exchange, they bring the the uh, what they do to the Palestinians. They bring that back home and they do it to people here. Um, I guess that's about it. Ceasefire now. Thank you very much, sir. Next speaker, please state your name. Hello, Council. My name is Amelia Rodriguez. I'm a USF student and a lifelong Tampa Bay Area resident. I'm here to tell you that I think it's reprehensible that not only does our federal government authorize arms deals to the Israeli government, but the people who should most represent me as a citizen in Tampa are silent on the issue. Since October 7th, the civilian death toll in Gaza has mounted to 33,000 846 individuals. I'd like to give you some perspective on that number. Israel's official reports state that only 160 of their soldiers were lost in war. If hearing just those numbers doesn't stir any feelings in you, maybe the fact that an estimated 40% of those civilian deaths were children. I would like you to show me a child who asks for war. Show me a child who's threatened violence, who is violent, who deserves their home taken, their family taken, or even their life taken. If you are morally opposed to that, if you feel there is no child who would do such a thing, I beg of you to please use your platform, your power, your voice to support the ceasefire and end the genocide in Gaza now. Thank you for your time, Council. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please uh, state your name. Come on up. Yes, ma'am. One second. Please state your name. Go ahead. Um, hello. <clears throat> My name is Sandra Zickri. Um, I wasn't given the opportunity to come fully prepared to, do, to discuss the matters further today. Um, however, I'd like to inform that I received a letter from the Chief of Police December 27th, 2023, and I will not be tolerating um, any type of fraudulent or criminal activity from anyone, um, regardless of professionalism. I will be forwarding my, my, my notice of intent to the city and various governmental officials because I have persistently asked for the Tampa police and the government to sustain from any further criminal or fraudulent behavior. There is no immunity for this type of, uh, <coughs> there's no type of immunity for this type of conduct. The details will further be disclosed at a later time. If you are a minority in Tampa, please understand that the medical and judicial system purposely work against you. They are primarily white, Caucasian, and have a lot of racial motive, um, engaged in Freemasonry cults in the KKK, and will violate your rights. Teresa Gaffney, the attorney who lost her bar license for reporting a Tampa judge's uh, sexual harassment, is seeking federal investigations, as we have mu mutual judges who have clearly violated the law on many different cases. And she has uncovered Tampa judges and second DCA appeal judges having ex parte communications and um, engaging in fraud. A news article was uh, released last month referencing to her case, which states, uh, quote, unquote, state requested to investigate Tampa judges. I have spoken with her and her attorneys, and I support criminal charges against this judge and the many uh, corrupted officials within this city that has either taken or ruined lives. If you could get rid of Mary O'Connor for a golf cart, you could do the same when the present chief and his department is engaged in discrimination, concealing a major hate crime, and committing fraud and federal violations. Um, I have constitutional rights and amendments. You need to teach your cops, your doctors, to keep their hands off of me. No one had a right to put their hands on me, threaten me, and such of the like. If you can't do your jobs, if you cannot do your jobs and keep your, your city safe, 
Instead of engaging in neo-Nazi propaganda, I suggest you, sit, you, you step down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, good morning. My name is Raisa Sanchez. Wait, come up and say it again. Raisa Sanchez. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm a constituent from Tampa. Like I said before, um, Mexican-American mother. I wanted to ask you guys, what are you guys doing to support the Muslim Arabs businesses? Because I know money was promised to Jews businesses as a support, right? What are you guys doing to show your support to Muslims and Arabs as well? Because at this moment, I feel like everything is being very biased. And I know you guys are here to represent everybody as a whole. And when you have people coming to each meeting, talking about this, and asking for you guys to, to come up with something that will give us a cease of fire, and nothing has been done, there's no comment, no nothing, it worries me, it really does. Because I'm sitting here like, wow, we have these people that are supposed to be our boys to represent us, but they don't say anything about this. We have protests, we call, we're showing up, what are you guys doing to show your support to Muslim and Arab communities as well? Also, I heard that there's some meetings that have been started with prayers and a middle of silence for the victims of um, Israel. And I would like to take a moment of silence for all the children and everybody that has been killed in Gaza. Many of you guys may or may not not know that the 2023 and 2024 school year has been canceled because many of the children have been killed. That should really shook you guys to the core, really. And I would like to take this moment to take a moment of silence for these people. As I know this is something that is not gonna be done by any of you guys, nobody's gonna start a meeting like that. Acknowledging that there's also victims on the other side, mostly children and women, and that you guys are helping and supporting that, and at the same time neglecting your citizens, your Muslim and Arab citizens, and our, your constituents, our concerns. Somebody needs to say something, and I want you guys to know that your silence is speaking volumes right now. Volumes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Lockett, are you the last speaker? Is there anybody else that's going to speak? If you are, please come up. No, we have one person in front of you, but I'm just, I'm just, um, is there anybody else that's going to speak after Ms. Lockett? All right, ma'am, come up. Please state your name. Good morning. I'm Tasia Stagg. Thank you. As I briefly mentioned in my September 21st hearing before you all, code enforcement has been targeting me. I had noticed that, among other problems, the manager of code enforcement misidentifies plants as weeds and previously repeatedly ordered the destruction of my Florida native plants. I know the identity of each plant species growing on my property. I've tried to find city staff to assist code enforcement with correctly identifying plants. Code enforcement continues to misidentify plants as weeds. In a special magistrate hearing yesterday, we demonstrated that code enforcement is violating the Florida Friendly Landscaping Statute, but the magistrate granted the city's wish to again abate my property, which will annihilate plants the city and state have, an in have a stated interest in protecting. Neighborhood enhancement should be taught that lush native vegetation is better for quality of life and property value than a clear-cut parcel full of dust through the drought months followed by mud in the rainy season and then unwanted turf grass species that require mowing. In a second case, mobility staff misapplied this reference document's standard highlighted there. This is a standard about intersections of street and driveway, and they applied it to the intersection of the sidewalk and my driveway. This may be the first time 
the city has used this interpretation. If they go on to apply this rule uniformly, not just reducing vegetation for the purpose of exposing the view of a stalking victim's property, it will harm the aesthetics of dozens or maybe hundreds of, hundreds of properties in the city, such as these I'll show you on Adalia Avenue on Davis Island. If applied uniformly, uh, this this would reduce the allowed hedge heights uh, even in the absence of a sidewalk. The code, as it's written, already um, acknowledges that there's such a thing as as protected species. It's fairly adequate as far as how it's written, but there is some confusion in it, like built into it, about nuisance vegetation because this, this part in parentheses says not including nuisance vegetation, and then later uh, what's, what's outlawed is nuisance vegetation. So it's a little bit confusing, but it's adequate as far as what they have to work with, and they're, they're just misinterpreting it. I need help. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yes, ma'am. Next speaker, please state your name. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Uh, Robin Lockett. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy and New I'm Year. Glad to be back. Uh, I wanted to come down today to uh, be consistent in my with this process of the curfew. I uh, still think that. This is an opportunity before, I know we have a meeting, there's a meeting scheduled on the 16th, and uh, there's a second hearing uh, uh, coming up. But I think that council should not be working in silo with this. I think that this affords us an opportunity to have council, have uh, school district, have county commission, have police department, have sh sheriff department, and have some members of the community come together, sit down, and just weigh this out along with parents, right? Because it's a bigger part than just the county. We don't want confusion. Ordinances that were created uh, years ago, are we just putting those ordinances back in place and just saying, hey, we're gonna try this just to be saying we're doing something? I don't want us to just be saying we're doing something. There is an issue. This issue has been going on, on way before Ybor City. East Tampa has been yelling about it for years. So how do we look at this in a, in a holistic way or a, a, a just thinking outside of the box to really have people around the table to mash this out? I think we're missing a, a different opportunity. Uh, the idea that uh, I keep hearing that the police will target the kids, then there's training for the, team, to the, for the, uh, for the police. How do you train them? What's the expectation of them? How do we train the community? on the new ordinance when it's completed. So there's so many different variables around this that we can really take part in and make this as good as we can because we're not gonna handle the real issue is how are these kids getting these guns. We're not gonna handle that. So let's create a Band-Aid tight enough because it's, it's gonna be a Band-Aid because the root of the problem is not uh, gonna be uh, resolved. So how do we uh, create a Band-Aid tight enough for it not to unravel as, uh, as quickly. I think with this, just this basic ordinance, that's, just a, that's not even a Band-Aid. That's just council, city saying we did something and not even looking towards uh, uh, even remotely resolving the problem. Uh, 30 seconds. The housing issue. Uh, there's a lot of conversation based on an article that, was, that came out about the 10,000 units and so forth. There's, so there's different opinions on it. What I look forward to is the $50 million that we got into the budget, how we really are gonna expand that, and how we're gonna move it. And council sticking to what they voted on to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Next speaker, please state your name. And hey, Ms. Good Bennett, you'll Stephanie be the, Pointer. the last speaker today. Oh, no, Carol Ann's there. Yeah, yeah, she'll be, oh, Ms. Bennett, it. you'll be the last okay. speaker today. Um, yes, ma'am. I always like to give credit where credit's due. Every day I start my, my life with a 
to-do list. Did you say your name, ma'am? Yeah. Okay, did I? go ahead. Keep Stephanie going. Pointer. Sorry. Anyway, um, every day I start with a to-do list. Some days I get to the end of it. Some days I don't. And there are lots of times that I have to reevaluate my goals. Today I want to talk about somebody else's goals. There's a lot of talk in the last week about affordable housing goals for the city. We're not even close to the 10% point that was quoted in, of the 10,000 units quoted in 2019. Well, back in 2019, we had a brand new council, a brand new mayor, and I had never even been to city council at that point. Um, I, I tell folks all the time, it takes six months to learn a job, to even figure out what you're doing, let alone take command of it. I'd argue that we should give the mayor some grace in that 10,000 goal because her team hit the ground running. They put together this plan for the city, which was not done during the Buckhorn administration. They had no plans. The mayor didn't, did a lot of great forecasting at that point in time, but she was relying on her administrative staff to calculate those housing numbers. Someone who was not a housing expert. That's, that's something we need to make very clear. In 2020, the mayor created a planning department. We had never had a planning department. In 2022, the mayor made one of the most brilliant moves of her administration, in my opinion. She hired Nicole Travis, who is a housing expert. Tr Nicole Travis has put together an amazing housing team. She works tirelessly for this city. She's not responsible for that 10,000 unit number. Now, we have the right folks in the right seat on the bus, but we have a secondary problem. There's no money. My friend who has a very similar uh, position to Nicole Travis's position, they received $388 million in ARPA money in Louisville. They put $100 million of it towards housing. I've given you the numbers, and I, I think there's probably a 2020 report that I didn't find because it says we only got $220 million, $222 million. We only attributed $17 million of that money, so less than 10% of the ARPA money to those numbers. So, but the real problem, the real crook of the issue is, here's my problem with this, out of all the ARPA money that we've received, the $220 million, there is $65 million that wasn't spent. Where did it go? Where did it go? I'm sure it was spent somewhere, but where did it go? Because it didn't go to the places that they reported it went. Thank you very much. Please, let's ask where the money went. I think Councilwoman uh, Hertek has already asked that question once. Thank but you. We've, we've, got to, we've got to move forward. Yes, ma'am. You are the last speaker. Please state your name. Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. Um, I was very interested in that FDOT presentation earlier. I thought that it was very interesting and very positive, the improvements they're making, the increased walkability, the increased <coughs> uh, bikeability, um, the increased transit. Um, and I would like to point out that those areas that they were discussing are the same areas that the department heads of this city, the transportation department, the economic development department, you name it, say this is where the most growth should occur in, the, in this city. And, the, and part of the reasons they give is because of the employment opportunity, the transit opportunity. This is where the growth should happen. Yet, the, the comp plan says the same thing. This is where the growth should happen. <clears throat> However, according to our own city planning department and the county um, planning commission staff, that part of the city has had the lowest growth in a 10-year period of time. It, when it was supposed to have the highest growth, it grew by 1%. We need to do what needs to be done to direct the growth where all the experts say it needs to be. Think of the opportunity, the employment opportunity in that area. And I want to point out something else that as someone who lives in an evacuation zone that is always being evacuated, those, the housing that is built in those areas of the city, they can shelter in place. We need to understand how important that is. 
We need to understand that that keeps people off the roadways so that the people who are being mandated to evac evacuate can do so in a timely, safe manner. It is very important that we direct growth to areas where they can shelter in place. Not to mention the fact that people who have limited means, evacuation is a tremendous burden. Um, the cost, they don't have a place to go. If they have to go to a, a, a government shelter, if you've ever talked to anyone who's ever done that, they say they will never, ever, ever, ever do it again. It, you end up spending being there for two or three days. If you're someone who lives paycheck to paycheck and you can't go to work for two or three days, it's devastating. The cost of evacuating, a late, latest study I heard was $1,400. People can't afford that, so let's build in safe areas. The other thing I want to talk about real quickly is the tree report that has been con continued. Is the timer? I, I don't know how much time I've got. Um, but anyhow, um, we've got all this money in the tree fund. We've got this million dollars, but we cannot seem to figure out how to plant trees. I think the mayor wants to plant trees. I think she supports it. I do not understand why we can't figure out how to do it. I, I stand before you with a bloodied face from banging my head against the wall about trying to save the trees we have, the ones that are doing the work. All these important issues, which are extremely important that you guys deal with, if, if the weather and the environment deteriorates, all those things take a back burner. The first thing we have to do is to protect ourselves against flooding, stormwater, all the things that the trees, which everybody agrees on, the trees are our number one line of defense. We have to protect our grand trees. The VRB is a problem. The last VRB hearing, they do not seem to understand. They approved, and I'm going to talk to Ms. Hertak about this because she should be on the VR to be. Oh, it's over. It's over. I think I can now. Anyhow. Um, they don't seem to understand the legalities of it, and it's Thank a big you very problem. Much. Thank you. Ms. Luke, is, is Nicole Rourke still online, the final registered speaker? Okay. That concludes public comment, and I will agree to a comment that was made about Nicole Travis. She is a, she is a superstar, so happy to hear that. So, no? All right. Um, per the, uh, the agenda, we're going to go to item number 39. We're going to take that up. Is there anybody that wishes to present that? Yes, ma'am? Yes, sir, I do. Right. Osea Wynn, Administrator of Neighborhood and Community Affairs. Council, it is with pleasure I stand before you today to present to you our nomination for the appointment of uh, Tony Moki for the Parks and Recreation uh, Director position. Um, oh, you're here. So Tony um, has been with the city for um, about 11 years uh, total. And um, he has served in the capacity as the manager of uh, special events. I'm quite sure a number of you have worked with him already. Um, we did a national search and uh, came back with our candidate internal. So at this point, I would like to have Tony say a few words uh, about himself and give you the opportunity to ask him questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Please state your name. Thank you, Chair. Tony Mulkey, Parks and Recreation, City of Tampa, and I am uh, just very uh, pleased to stand in front of you with this consideration for the appointment to the Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, I understand the history and the importance of this department. Uh, it's been award-winning. We have a phenomenal professional team, and I appreciate the support of everyone. Uh, I consider the role, if approved, to be able to support them. And, and be able to move forward and help improve the quality of life within the community. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about my background. I think I've spoke with most of you and look forward to it. Thank you very much. So congratulations on your, your nomination uh, and, and slash appointment. Um, I'm always dis disheartened to hear we did a national search because I sincerely believe that the best of the best is already within the city of Tampa throughout many departments. And uh, I will say that I got elected in 2015, but I knew of you before. Um, a group of us wanted to do an event in the city of Tampa a couple years before, and I think you were one of the first people that we spoke with. So with that, and then when I got elected, I've always seen you in a variety of capacities throughout the city in various projects. So you know your stuff. I think you're a great choice. Uh, and I'm going to be very uh, enthusiastic in supporting uh, your, your confirmation today. 
Council Member Hertek. I saw your microphone Thank on. You. Council Member Miranda, Council Member Thank Thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, oh, no, no, Hertek first. Hertek. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And no worries. No worries. Oh, um, right. I, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> I wanted to uh, say congratulations. Um, you and I have worked together from the beginning of your time as interim director, and any question I've had, you've been able to answer, and if you haven't, you've gotten back to me incredibly quickly. I'm really excited about some of the um, ideas you have and how open you've been to suggestions and thoughts, and you and I had a great conversation yesterday about the, all the, the folks who are under you in the departments um, and how I had no idea there were seven departments under parks. I mean, that's a lot of different moving parts. And I know from your experience, having read your Vita, how you've worked in different communities under parks to learn different strategies and, and ways to do things. But you've been with us for almost 10 years, I believe. And so I'm really excited to continue working with you um, in your new role and uh, look forward to um, doing some tours with parks to learn more about what you all do. Thank you. Miranda Vieira. Uh, thank you very much. I agree with Chairman uh, Miniscalco's statements. Uh, sometimes uh, the all-American candidate is right under your nose and you don't understand it. But when you give individuals a chance from within the department to work their way up, that's the American way system as it should be. That doesn't mean you can't go outside the, the unit. However, I, I think you've done an excellent job. Uh, you have a great staff. What I see coming in your division is that Park and Recreation, along with the others that you under, under yourself, it's one of the fastest growing in the city. There's been more expansions in different areas. We try to get the kids. When you have a kid going to the park and coming home, that's a great education. That's a way of understanding about other people, how they act and how they relate to each other. And communication maybe is what's lacking in this country. I'm not sure. But uh, I'd like to have a meeting with yourself. And I, I think uh, the individual, the chief, uh, our, our leader who used to be in District 6, we've had something to do with Wells Wood for a long, long time. And like you, your assistant chief of staff, Mr. Bennett, myself, and the people from Wells Wood to end this have been going on for over two years. And I'm not here to say I will support you anyway when you tell me yes or no because you're the one for it. But I'd like to get that beyond us. It's something that's costing money and it's not good for the kids. And I want to say that uh, I appreciate everything you've done, appreciate everyone in the staff has done, and uh, congratulations on your possible. We haven't taken a vote yet, so i got to be very careful when I say my words on your appointment as a, to the head of this great, great city department with others, six others under you. Thank you very much for doing what you've done and your staff also be committed. No leader can lead unless someone follows. Appreciate Councilman it. Vier. Thank you very much. And you know, I agree with everybody and I look forward to uh, voting for you, sir. And, in our reactions, you've just been a gentleman, and, and, and more than that, I can really tell that you have the confidence and support of the wonderful people uh, standing there behind you, so many of whom I've you know, been able to work with on some really meaningful projects that, that mean a lot to me, mean a lot to them, and come from the heart. Um, and, and one thing I do want to emphasize that I want to just continue to challenge all of us on is just making sure that all of our parks are accessible to kids with intellectual disabilities, with physical disabilities, neurological challenges, autism. I know we're 100% we're on the same page there. You know, last week we, we were able to honor the late Mike Phillips, and tomorrow we'll be honoring uh, Jay Clifford McDonald, the founder of McDonald's Training Center. And, uh, you know, in this city and throughout Florida, throughout the United States, we have a population of Americans, young Americans, sometimes older Americans, uh, who can uh, uh, use parks who are all too often denied access to those parks on account of, of, of how they, who they are. And um, that's something that should outrage us all. And does it cost us money to make it accessible? Absolutely, but it's 100% worth it. And we, we have the All Abilities Park in um, New Tampa, and I'd love to see an All Abilities Park, and I know we also have one in, uh, in West Tampa, but I know we're also gonna have one in, in East Tampa and South Tampa, and, and one park in, in, in each part of the city of Tampa that's dedicated to kids uh, for full accessibility and make sure that all of our parks um, have at least one big piece of playground equipment that's uh, uh, accessible to somebody with a wheelchair, et cetera. Because that, that's a moral statement also for moms and dads who are, have struggles, the likes of which if, you don't, uh, uh, are, if you're not in that situation, you can't even begin to imagine. So, uh, but again, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here and I, and I see a lot of amens. So, but again, look forward to working with you, sir, and voting with you or for you. And I think you're gonna do a great job. And like I said, you're a fine gentleman. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed working with you. Appreciate your help and your department's help. Always 
appreciate working with Ms. Wynn as well, uh, Administrator Wynn. Um, uh, we found out about, at least I found out about your appointment on Friday, I think it was, and I contacted you either Friday or Monday morning, and you quick changed your schedule and met with me, which I appreciate we had not met one-on-one -on -one before, and I appreciated that, that long and, and good discussion. Um, one of the things that I said is that um, the public expects us to fix the parks, and, um, and the fact that we fix a park or don't fix a park is not a political issue. Um, it should, we should make sure the administration hopefully will collaborate with city council and the staff to make sure that these issues are not politicized. Um, the public expects these things to happen and from their point of view, they don't care. They don't see the difference between city council, the administration and uh, the mayor's office and staff. They just see whether the city has approved something or not. And so I hope that we can all work together going forward uh, to try to get things done. Um, I, uh, I, I fully support you. He, he has a master's degree in parks, and so uh, I, you know, I'm one that believes in education, and I think you're, you're uniquely qualified to get this position. We would, um, <coughs> I can see how in a national search that you would come up. I asked the question of the city attorney. Um, I, I went, you know, I was on the Charter Review Commission, and I went through and read the charter, and I had long conversations with Mr. Shelby. I don't believe that your position has to be approved by city council. I think it's an administrative decision. I think the city attorney disagrees. If that's true, uh, section 6.3 says that all the people above you have to be approved. And to one of the points in public comment, there was a deputy administrator under Ms. Wynn that was just appointed. Um, and I strongly object to that appointment. The public objects. And I look forward to having a robust, long discussion with lots of public input about that position. Somebody in public comment mentioned a high profile person who was just fired last week. Uh, there's been no notice to city council and um, no notice to the public about what happened. And uh, I, I would appreciate if the administration would, would um, work in a transparent way to let us know what happened and to communicate with the public. But the public expects uh, not to have, not to work toward checking the box for the administration, but to, to work toward getting things done in the community because they want service, they need services. We all know that, that uh, the violent crime rate has been going up exponentially until the last year. And we, in the, the programs that you all run in the Parks Department are essential to getting things done. And so I look forward to supporting you, working with you, hopefully working with the administration and trying to figure out how we can find more funding for the programs you do. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Clendon. Hello, Mr. Mulkey. Today's about you. Uh, and, and congratulations or, or, you know, looking into that crystal ball. Congratulations. You know, I, I hope you brought a printing press with you because we're going to ask you to do a lot more than we're giving you the money to accomplish. So that's, it's, uh, you know, the, you almost have an impossible task because anybody that lives in the city of Tampa or, and looks at our parks, we know we, the deficit is so great. Uh, the infrastructure of, of our public facilities and our public parks and our public programs is almost insurmountable uh, with the present funding stream. And it's one of the reasons why during our budget discussions, I was an advocate for increased budget, uh, increased money to be able to finance things like this. And as we talk about um, public safety, as uh, my fellow councilman just discussed, pop parks is a critical element of that. We talk about the curfew. We talk about these programs for youth being able to give them alternatives to get them off the streets. You know, this is going to fall within this, this department. Um, hopefully, I look forward to your ideas on, on how to accomplish this within the community so that, again, we work hand-in-hand -hand with organizations like PAL, uh, which I'm a strong supporter of. Uh, I look forward to you, you working with that and, and, and doing, honestly, to doing much, much more than we give you the money to accomplish. And uh, congratulations on, on, on in this new uh, position. It's a, the city of uh, Tampa is well served, and I'm you're just joining a great team of public servants. And I, I'm a very a, a big fan of the employees of the city of Tampa and their dedication and what they do for the citizens of Tampa every day. And thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Moran, to make that motion. Chairman, I, I move the nomination. Uh, Mr. Tony Malpe, the director of Park and Recreation Department, uh, item number 39 on the agenda on today, uh, January the 11th, 2024, at approximately 11.22 a.m. Give the address? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilman Vieira, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations. Thank you much. <laughs> Mr. Mulkey, is that your lovely wife? Would you like to introduce her? Yes. <laughs> 
Vanessa's girlfriend. That's really Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Awkward. Not on TV. <laughs> oh, no. You can't keep a seat. I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay Bogus, my my better half. So. I'm sorry, I'm crying. <laughs> so you're a, you're a PhD? I am. I'm a professor in the Department of Criminology at USF. Wow, very good. Wonderful. Very Welcome. good. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, next up we have this uh, walk-on item regarding... Um, Collective bargaining agreement. Who wishes to present that? Is that you, Chief Bennett? Yeah, just a, a moment as the room yeah. clears out. Well, he's going to kick it off. Louis Vieira is a Merle Haggard fan. I saw him live with Bob Dylan. He stole the show. Merle Haggard was fantastic. He opened for Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan's show was terrible. Merle Haggard stole the show at USF Sunday. <clears throat> yes, sir. All right, again, good morning, John Bennett, Chief of Staff. <clears throat> and, of course, good morning to the public. <clears throat> the resolution that was uh, a part of the... Um, the walk-on <clears throat> opportunity, which again, we appre appreciate the support of council and working with the union. Um, as the public knows, uh, we have almost 5,000 employees. Uh, the police department, uh, below the rank of lieutenant, the rank of lieutenant, the uh, amalgamated transit unit, which is the general employees union, and then the IAFF local 754 over the fire department uh, has three different collective bargaining agreements. Um, in the <clears throat> agreements that were settled last fiscal year for the following three years, which carry us through September 30th of 2025, allow for a wage reopener if the consumer price index in March of the preceding year of the budget is over 5%. It happened to be that way in March of this year. All three unions requested to open wage negotiations. Uh, we met with all three unions over that period of time. The PBA and the ATU settled for their 4.5% that was already put into the agreement. We continue to negotiate in good faith with the fire union, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for 11 different meetings. Uh, eventually, the fire union settled on the 4.5% increase. However, they requested to open the contract in the wage table to negotiate the, the very end of the pay table, meaning that each pay grade in the union, and I could set up an example if you'd like, um, has an end state. Every year you can, through merit, um, gain another uh, level in that pay table. And then, of course, you get promoted. Uh, we have a city policy, and it's also put into the agreement that you'd get a 4% increase. And we wanted to make sure that uh, the transitions between one pay grade and another for a promotion did yield that 4% increase. So between those two items, uh, making sure that the end or the senior position, which coincidentally in that pay grade already exists in the police department, and then we treated the ATU's contract last time as well uh, to increase their opportunities based on merit performance. So fire was the only one that did not have that end state in each of the pay grades, and that's what we negotiated in good faith with the union. We uh, received a tentative agreement in early December on FY24, and then another one for FY25 near the end of December. And then again, as we mentioned earlier, those votes were tallied, and we were informed of both votes in writing on January 5th of this year. And, um, and then, of course, the CFO is here to talk about any financial impact for FY24, but it's my understanding from working with the union, this on average would affect about four out of every 10 firefighter paramedics who have reached that end state in their pay grade. So it, it, from a numbers point of view of about 700 firefighter paramedics, we could be talking about 43% of them or obviously close to half that have reached that end state. The rest of them could potentially reach the end of that pay grade at any time in their career. And this just gives them a 3% increase um, for reaching that end position and a senior status from what previously existed. 
And of course, then we did the cleanup of the pay tables for FY24 and FY25 to make sure that if you do get promoted, that you do receive that 4% because we went through and scrubbed this as part of the negotiations and we found some gaps or deltas in that pay table. So both of those two things are submitted through the resolution and those pay tables that were tentatively agreed on. And that's what you would be voting on to amend the current contract, not create a new contract, but amend the current contract till the end of September of 2025, which would then begin fiscal year 26. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you know, my, the, I had concerns and I had uh, spoken with you several days ago. I spoke with Mr. Stocko several times over the last uh, week or however uh, time it was because my biggest concern was uh, will this be an impact? And the question was answered on the budget. Will we need an amendment? Will we hear in the, this upcoming budget this summer, well, council, we're, gonna, we're looking at a millage increase because you, you approved this and this and this and this and you approved it. You know, you can't go back on it now. Those questions were answered to me. Uh, you specifically, uh, Chief Bennett, uh, told me the uh, fiscal impact, the, the, n not the, the impact that wouldn't be happening because it's so minor. Um, you know, our firefighters, our public safety folks are not paid enough for what they do. You can't put a price on it. A million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever it is, uh, for the stress that they go through, everything that they go through, the sacrifices that they have to make, uh, personal lives, family lives. Um, but, you know, I know there's going to be other questions and comments. I'm happy to support it because my questions were answered. And my concerns, uh, you know, were, were uh, taken care of in the sense that, you know, will this come back to bite us in the future? No, because it's a very small amount in comparison to the to the grand scheme. So again, thank you uh, for answering my questions the other day. Thank you to Mr. Stocko, who we spoke at least three or four times, I think, and, and my questions were answered. So thank you very much. Councilman Clendenin, I saw your microphone yeah. on first. Thank you. Um, we, we spoke yesterday, and I, I expressed to you my concern about the timeliness of this and the procedure. I, I'm not, I wasn't, I, I don't like it. Um, I, you know, also I first, you know, really got the first time I got the briefing was not until yesterday afternoon. That being said, you know, you, you did answer the, my questions and you know, I'm, I'm satisfied with the answers. I don't think that this should be set a precedent of how we do business. And so I don't want to see this again like this. Um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say this is minor because then you've got, uh, year after year implications, budget implications that, you know, this, this, this thing compounds itself. So, I mean, it, it is, it is made, but, um, we do have to compensate our, our folks justly and fairly and equitably. And I think that this brings the, brings our firefighters in line with where they probably should be in, in line with, um, other workers of similar types. So it, it's the right thing to do. Um, but it is something that ha I think should be discussed. Um, again, I don't, I don't care for this particular, the way this got to us, but it's, it's, it's got, it got to us and here we are today. So we'll, we'll make that decision and, uh, and, uh, I'm going to support, I'm going to support this. I'm going to support, of course, the firefighters. I appreciate the fact that the administration worked with the firefighters to, to reach this agreement. I think that's a, everybody should be, uh, applauded for those efforts, um, that they work well with the, with the labor organization to, to reach an amicable agreement. Thank you so much. Anybody else? It's too quiet. Councilman Vieira, Councilman Herte. Thank you very much. And, and you know, with regards to folks um, uh, uh, not liking the procedure and how it got, got here, I don't think anybody would. But the alternative and the reason I did the memo is because the alternative was to wait till next week when we have CRA uh, and then take it up the week thereafter when most firefighters are going to be gone, the union leadership is <coughs> going to be gone at a convention, and then they'd probably miss their paycheck. So, you know, this is a, a, a unique situation on something that none of us want to see happen, which is seeing folks miss part of their hard work for a pay increase in a paycheck. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why I, I ultimately believe this is going to get a six to zero vote. And I'm sure if Councilwoman Henderson were here, this would be a seven to zero vote because uh, of the hard work our firefighters do. It's, it's uh, our, our firefighters uh, uh, live on average. Uh, 10 years less than the average person because of the hard work that they do, the tremendous hits that they take on the job. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when you take a look at the things that they do on the job and the union that they have here in Local 754, that's why we need unions. This is a very pro-labor union, Tampa City Council. We have three members here, Councilman 
Clendenin, Councilwoman Henderson, Councilwoman Hurtak, who have been or are uh, union members. And uh, when you take a look at why we need uh, unions in Tampa, in Florida, in the United States, it's because people, you know, give all on the job and all they want is respect and dignity. And our firefighters, as well as our police officers, give all, and, and our ATU members, give all on the job and all they want is respect and dignity and they do the toughest work. You want to see the tough work that they do. Take a look at what our police officers had to do this morning in Tampa City Council for us. That's not easy work. Um, so that's why um, we all support them here on Tampa City Council. So glad to support this and, and, uh, and, and glad that we're going to see this pass in a timely manner so that money can be in paychecks. Thank you. Council Member Hurtak. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I want to um, thank Council Member Clendenin because I think the discussion about equity and fairness is to me the crux of this particular contract negotiation, um, giving them the extra top that the both the police and you <coughs> already have. I think that's, to me, the, the focus of this. Um, I do want to ask um, Mr. O'Hara to come up and talk about the financial implications specifically, because I do not believe the public has had that information. And that's why that's why I want I want the public to know what that implication is. But I also want to thank Mr. Vieira for bringing up um, the important work that the firefighters do every day. And I want to say that um, for those of you who missed the firefighters ball, the video that they showed of what they did this year was really tremendous. And I hope they put that up on social media somewhere for others to see because it was quite a year. Yep. Yes, sir. Mr. Rohara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. Dennis Rohara, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, just to clarify, the component that I will address is this extra 3% on the last step that I think everybody's been discussing. We anticipate uh, for fiscal year 24, the impact will be just over a million dollars, $1.1 million, $1.2 million. Again, depending on the timing of when council approves it and when it hits the pay system, et cetera. Uh, for context, that's about 1% of the fire rescue uh, personnel budget. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Council Member Carlson. I want to say again, I support firefighters 100%. Thank them for putting their lives on the line. Um, I think there were two fires on, at least in the last 24 hours, and I know you all uh, put yourselves at risk, and, and, and you have health issues later, later in life because of the risk you put. My, as I've told many of the firefighters before, my, my cousin out west is a firefighter, and he fights the big forest fires and also fires in a city. And, and uh, I, I know his wife uh, is terrified every time he goes out. And so I 100% I support you all, and I want to do what's fair. Um, what, one of the issues in this is that if we don't approve it now, the firefighters could miss two or three weeks of the pay increase, and I'm not going to fight against that. However, as I said this morning, I'm very disappointed with the administration for not notifying us in December or before about this, uh, for not putting any notice of it in the in the – um, agenda at all for not asking us in at least one or two meetings in December to put this on the agenda at least tentatively uh, for not putting any reference to it in the agenda on Friday uh, for not giving City Council any of the documentation until yesterday afternoon which is less than 24 hours before the vote um, uh, there was no transparency whatsoever on this and this is a very uh, important issue that we need to pass but if we, if we set a precedent, then the next time there'll be an issue that, that the public may not want to pass, that they may not may want to get public input on, and they won't have any idea. And so I'm gonna make a motion later in the meeting to try to end this uh, walk-on. Even if it's a project that I like, we shouldn't have a walk-on. Um, and this one I do like and I do support. Um, the other thing, uh, Mr. Harrow, the question is, and again, I'm, I'm supportive of this and I'm gonna vote for it because I'm for the firefighters, but the public, as, as Councilwoman Hurtak said, the public has no, had no transparency to this. It's not, it, maybe it was put on, on, on base last night, but the public has not seen any of the documentation. Can you tell us, um, and now, I, I, if I remember correctly, Chief Bennett told me yesterday it was 1.4 million, maybe it's 1.1. Can you tell me, um, um, you know, a few months ago when we were going through the budget, we were desperately looking for $100,000 to spend on whatever we could. Where's this 1.1 or 1.4 coming from this year? And then it's a recurring thing, so it's gonna be at least that amount going forward. Um, my second question maybe is to Mr. Shelby. Um, maybe a 1.4 million item would be on consent, 
but this is recurring. And so over 30 years, it'll be at least 30, 40 million. Would that be on consent or would that, or would that be a major item that we would vote on separately? Maybe you could answer that and then I'll go to Mr. Harrow to answer where the money's coming from because like Chair Maniscalco, um, I, don't want, um, I don't want the administration to come back to us in, in, the, in the summer and say, well, you've approved all these things so now you have to increase taxes because I absolutely will not support that. And, and the same thing, the public doesn't want bonding. And so we can't bond ourselves to, to, to fund all the things the administration wants um, and with a disregard to the future um, uh, uh, of the city. M Mr. Um, Shelby, could you just answer the question on consent? It, it, if we look at an item that goes on consent or on the regular agenda, would if do we count just one year impact or do we look at the cumulative impact over a certain period of time? The short answer is that for FY25, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. O'Hara, it'll be baked into the FY25 proposed budget. That's, that's correct. It will be part of it our recommended come to budget council. to city council. It will come to council. No, no, but what I mean is if, if this had been on the regular agenda today, would it have been on consent if it was only 1.4 million, or would we have calculated over 20 or 30 years <laughs> and said it exceeds 20 million, so it would have been a separate item, not on consent? You wouldn't have calculated it. It would have been on the consent docket as your previous- We would just count as, one year. As, as your previous uh, so Mr. contracts had been. So Mr. O'Hara, um, can you just tell us, uh, wh where did this additional money come from? Because a few months ago we had no additional money for anything, and we and we wanted to spend money on things like this. But where did the money come from? Uh, and if and if there is a source of funding, is there additional funding be available beyond this 1.4? No, that's a very good question. And and let me, if I can, set the table. You know, I, I mentioned earlier uh, the uh, percentage impact of the fire rescue budget, about one percent. Fire rescue personnel budget is just under 124 million dollars. In the current fiscal year, again, we think it's going to impact about a million, million one. And I don't want to belittle that amount, but it's early in the fiscal year, and this is part of how we manage the budget throughout the year. A 1% variation is, is well within what we would find acceptable. So we, we previously asked during the budgeting process, we said, sorry to interrupt you, no, we no. said if there's additional funding because, mm -hmm. because the estimates are, are below what the actual amount brought in, we would like the administration to come back to us and tell us what excess funding is so that we can be involved on the front end of deciding where that money is going to go. So is it that the, uh, the actual revenues exceeded expectations? And, and if so, is there more money beyond this 1.1 available in this fiscal year? It's not that there's more revenues than anticipated. We're still closing out last year, and of course, what we know we're, we're to come to council for that. It's, it's early, again, early in the fiscal year, and with a budget this large, and this isn't just specific to fire, it's all large budgets, especially personnel budgets. So many variables happen during the year, whether it's overtime, terminations, retirements, sick, annual. So it investment. came out of the fire budget. It's just we were under, okay. Yes, sir, you actually said it more simply than I. Yes, thank you. And, um, and then the last thing, uh, my understanding is that is that the overall fire budget, I think it was last fiscal year, was 800000 or a million or so below uh, the estimates. And then that money went back to the, the um, general fund instead of being used on equipment for firefighters. Is that correct? And yes, sir. Who made that decision and why? It is, and, and again, let me back up and set the table. The fire department brings in some revenues, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not insignificant, but the overwhelming majority of their revenues come from the general fund. So at the end of the year, as the books close, any particular surplus would be returned back to the general fund for council to decide what to do with as part of the budget process. But I, what, what I would suggest, and just to end the, in this discussion, mm -hmm. is that if there's, a, if there's excess money left over, especially in fire, uh, we know the needs. The, the, the fire uh, fighters need safety equipment, and they need basic renovations to provide safer environments in their, in their um uh, in their uh, fire stations, and uh, and we also need new fire stations. But if if firefighters need basic equipment to keep them safe, I would say that we w we should have city council should ha be able to have a discussion about where that money would go before it was put back to the general fund because we have tremendous needs in our fire department, and I don't think there's any greater thing that we can do to then protect our uh, first responders um, with the proper safety equipment. Thank you, Councilman Miranda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate Mr. Bennett. Uh, you mentioned the ATU and you mentioned the Tampa 
police department. And yes, what we're doing here at some grade level, we're matching what was the other two got, have received. Am I correct in what you mentioned? Uh, John Bennett, Chief of Staff, you're exactly right, Councilman Miranda. When, um, when we finished the negotiations <coughs> over the wage reopener and the uh, IFF uh, requested to reopen these tables, the first thing we did is went back and looked at the senior positions in the police department and the opportunity to get an increased merit in the ATU. And this is on parity or on par with that with fire at those top step positions in each of those pay grades. So it is a, a maneuver towards parity. Um, and the administration supported by council, of course, has always been working towards equity and parity in these spaces. And I think it, it meets that at a reasonable cost level as discussed by the CFO. In fact, I want to thank uh, past council members way back, back in 74, 75, Catherine Barger, Sandy Friedman, uh, Lee Duncan, and I believe it's Charlie Spicoli myself that uh, received uh, not too pleasant of an editorial back in 75 or that era when uh, it was called the Fireman Five. It was never a Fireman Five. We just voted to override the mayor, and that was the first time that I ever recall me voting to override the mayor. It might have been another one, but that one sticks in my mind. And it wasn't that we were trying to give anybody an unjust raise. It was time that we competed with other areas so we wouldn't lose the quality of the individuals we had, not only in that department, but in police department all over the city. It has gotten to the point now that it's very difficult to, because of the salaries of how they are, to find individuals that want to serve in any division other than elected officials. Elected officials are the only one that know what the salary is. And they know when they get in. And I don't believe all, any one of us took a job just because of salary. We took it because we want to make the city of Tampa, whatever you serve at, whatever location, whatever municipality or state government, to make it better or try to make it better. And, and it's just my opinion. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other people's name, and I think the, the fifth one was Pecola, but I'm not sure. And uh, so I, I'm going to approve this in my vote anyway because it brings the status, not beyond but equal to or not greater than the other two, Tampa Police Department and the Amalgamated Transit Union. And that's what I want, parity to all and the same area. And uh, we, we want to make Tampa what is happening every day. And you know, the more we do and the more people see, the more unhappy I think they are. I don't know why. That bothers me a lot. Thank you very much. Well, it looks like the votes may be here. Uh, Mr. Stocker, do you want to add anything? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to speak. I wanted to, uh, Nick Stocker, President of Tampa Firefighters, I wanted to speak a little bit on the walk-on portion of the agenda. And I do have some notes because I didn't want to miss anything to include Council, the city, and the public, was that the walk-on was requested based on a timeliness matter. And when we came to this agreement in the middle of de December, right before the holidays, um, from a timeliness standpoint, it was to get it done for today. We held voting over the holidays, uh, secret ballot tabulating, um, all staffing at the office over the holidays. And we had an overwhelming support from our membership with over 500 uh, total votes and 97% of them being yes. Um, so that is a, a good reflection of the product that this is in bridging the gap with other unions within the city. Um, we do maintain a close communication with the other unions and the other presidents and we, we, we do all try to stay on the same page um, because we are union strong. Um, because of the language that was agreed upon, these raises for the fire union wouldn't be in effect until the membership agreed and also you all council agreed. For that reason, from a timeliness standpoint, um, that's how we got to where we are today, or more so last week on Friday. And when we reported to the city on Friday of our results, it was a time crunch. You know, from then, I was also trying to communicate with council um, over the weekend. Um, and the thing that the city said since day one of these negotiations was that 
um, both Chief Bennett and CFO Ruggiero, is that we would be able to stand here shoulder to shoulder in front of council and to the public and explain our reasoning how we got to this agreement. And I can't thank anyone more than, than the two here um, beside us, as well as the mayor and the entire negotiation team in making that possible and us being able to answer these questions from council. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, given what you all are saying and what we're hearing, it sounds great, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, we really want to appreciate and thank the mayor, Mayor Jane Castor, Chief Negotiator John Bennett, the CFO Dennis Ruggiero, and the entire City of Tampa negotiating team. Um, Chief Bennett has answered my phone call every single time that I've called since I've been in this position for a little over a year now. Um, over the weekend, there was a medical emergency with a retired TPD officer who is Chief John Bennett's lifelong friend uh, that passed away. So rest in peace to that police officer. But Chief John Bennett <coughs> still communicated with me all weekend in how many attempts we can to best present this to council without any feedback, although his friend may have seen the last moments of his life. So. Our condolences to that retired officer, but for the public and council to understand or help understand that this was really a, a tough work in progress for all parties. <clears throat> we want to thank uh, the fellow unions, the fellow brothers and sisters of the PBA and ATU, Steve Simon and Brandon. We do communicate often and we are thankful for the, for the um, connection that we have with the unions in the city of Tampa. I personally, Nick, want to thank our negotiations team for the countless meetings that we had to have over the last fiscal year during tough times, during the good times, the yelling and the smiling. Um, it was a, it was very, it was an eventful year. Um, that would be uh, Mike Billick, our vice president, Kurt Terrell, our vice president, Donnie Snipes our now secretary, Ryan Burkett, and our executive board member of the year for last year, Walter Hill. Without them, we wouldn't be able to be here today. Um, City Council, you all have known us for a while. Your support does not go unnoticed. Those that call me, those that visit the stations, uh, those that are pro-union and pro-firefighters, we're paying attention, and we really appreciate all y'all's support. Um, not just today, but every day. Um, this is why we endorse you all as elected officials, um, for that Maltese cross, for that um, reflection of our support. And for those that we hadn't supported in the past, we hope that this can further our relationships and continue the good relationships we have with our elected uh, union uh, elected city council officials. So thank you. Um, as we work on making up for decades of um, mishaps, we're confident that today's success in these wages, as well as the item being brought forth on fire station bonding, is critical to the public safety, to those that we serve and the community in which we respond to. Uh, as Councilman Miranda said, you know, many people sign up for the job not for what they get paid. They love what they do. They love running the calls. They love providing a service. They thrive for saving lives and driving those fire trucks and fire ambulances. This is just a way to show our appreciation to them for the work that they do. That's all that I have. Councilman Beard, would you like to move the resolution? So moved. Motion from Councilmember Beard, second, second Councilmember Clendenin. and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Congrats, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a liability. 
Thank you very much. All right, let's do um, consent agenda. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We have item number five. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right, item number five, this is the uh, Gas Works uh, CDD. Yes, ma'am. Rebecca Johns, legal department. Um, this is the first reading of an ordinance to establish the Gas Works Community Development D District. This comes before you based on a petition that was filed by Inframark on behalf of KS Ebor Master Developer LLC, which is the owner of a portion of the property. Um, community Development <laughs> Districts um, serve the purpose of operating and maintaining public infrastructure within the boundaries of the district. This CDD will manage the infrastructure within the property that's generally encompassed by Nebraska Avenue to the west, 15th Street to the east, the Selman Expressway to the south, and Fifth Avenue to the north. There's an ownership and maintenance matrix that's attached to the petition and attached to the ordinance that sets out the division between the city and the CDD as to who's going to maintain what. There is a typo in that matrix that will be corrected before a second reading. Under stormwater, it should say all public stormwater, not all public sewer, but that will be corrected before a second reading. Um, the petitioner is not here today, but they will be here for the second reading if this progresses to that. Um, but I can answer any questions that you have. The petition to establish the district is on file with the clerk's office, if anyone would like to see that. And also, we do request that if you schedule the second reading, that it be scheduled for February 1st and not for January 25th because of statutory notice requirements we need until February 1st. Council Member Carlson. Just a couple questions I comment. Could you just, for the public's sake, explain um, what the uh, transparency or uh, public records or sunshine duties are of, the, um, of a CDD? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Can I answer it at second reading? <laughs> sure. So the, the, the point is that, is that um, in the past, the city, through the CRA and, and also the city, has subsidized development and uh, the public objected to that. Um, in this case, there, there are some asks of the CRA to invest in infrastructure only, not to subsidize development, but infrastructure only. And we've set up a, a new model now. CDDs are used throughout the state in lots of cities, and I guess we have lots here too, but um, the idea here is that there will be an intermediary, uh, which is the CDD, and it, 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 it would uh, up, update um, uh, infrastructure, and then eventually, um, it, it, typically CDDs, and you can say this next time, but I think t typically CDDs are controlled by developers in advance to to handle the the public infrastructure, and then eventually they're turned over to um, whoever the eventual property owners are. Am I in the ballpark? That's correct. So I I, I think it, the good news here is that uh, that we'll be talking about the other parts of it in the CRA, but I appreciate the developers and their consultants and the city staff working on this new model so that it's not um, it's not like the the old giveaway models of the past. Morris can answer your question about the Sunshine Law. <laughs> yeah. CDDs are by statute a special unit of local government and they're subject to the same Sunshine and Public Records laws that we are subject to the city of Tampa or any other local government. Yeah, so the point is that if, if any CRA or city money flows through that to, uh, to, to handle infrastructure, it's an additional layer of public oversight so the public can have eyes into it, even though in the short term it may be controlled by a developer, uh, it, will, it will have full public scrutiny. And so it's a, it's a different way of addressing um, it, uh, urban infrastructure in the city. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, council member. Uh, this CDD is not much different than any other CDD, is it? Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is there anybody that is outside of the city that's representing this that's speaking today, or is it just you making the presentation? No, they will be coming for second to reading. make second. a presentation yeah. to make a presentation at second reading. All right, but I can take public comment now for this, Mr. Shelby. I wait a second reading. Well, you, okay. pub, the, the appropriate place would have been pub, general public comment. Okay, it'll general, be it'll be coming back for a second reading right. and a public there is hearing. A, the second reading is a public hearing. Yes. On February 1st. Yeah, February 1st. All right. Council Member Miranda, would you mind reading? No, sir, not at all. Thank you, sir. Item, uh, item number five, uh, file number CDD24-2207. What is being presented for first reading consideration? An ordinance 
in the city of Tampa, Florida, establishing the Gas Works Community Development District pursuant to Chapter 190, Florida Statutes for Property Generally Encompassed by Nebraska Avenue to the west, 15th Street to the east, the Selma Expressway to the south, 5th Avenue to the north, describing the external boundaries of the district, describing the functions and powers of the district, designating the initial members of the district board of supervisors, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Miranda, second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Second reading and adoption will be held on February 1st, 2024 at 9.30 a.m. All right, thank you. Consent agenda. Councilman Vieira, you have public safety yes, six or Mr. nine? Mr. Yes. Chair, real, real fast, I need to recuse myself on number nine. I don't have the form. I'll bring it later. Uh, but my, um, my firm uh, does business with the school district. And although we don't work on anything related to the city directly in an abundance of caution and to, to avoid the perception of a conflict, I'm going to recuse myself. Okay, so Council Member Vieira, would you move on in six, seven, and eight? Yes, sir. Well, actually, number eight, I, um, we got a request at eight be heard with the bonding um, uh, item for, for Tampa Fire, yes, yeah, 78 as well. So if I may, I'll move for six and seven. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Vieira and a second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Which number is the uh, firefighter? 78. 78. Yes, I just sir. want to make a note here. So yes, number sir. eight. And I should have said at the beginning. I no, 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 it's okay. Move just nine, so I. Nine as well. Yeah. All right. And and then we'll wait for Councilman Carlson to step out. And then if I may, I, I, I know they don't have to. Um, number nine. Second. We have a motion nine. from Councilman Vieira on number nine and a second from Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried with Carlson abstaining and Henderson being absent. Okay, next up we have Council Member Hertak items 10 through 19. I move items 10 through 19. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Hertak, second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Uh, lots of good events coming up Fiesta Day and MLK Parade and all that stuff. Um, then I move items 20 through 33. Second. Well. We have a motion from Council Member Hertak for 20 to 33, second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Council Member Miranda, you're the Finance Committee. Uh, 34 through 40 minus item 39. 34 through 40. Minus 39. Minus 39. We have a second? Second. We have a second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Council Member Carlson, you are building zoning. Can I, can I speak to this for a second? Because uh, items 48 and 49 on the, uh, you know, we heard it in public comment about the allocations for Salida House, and then we've got for REACH, the 225. I, I, I would kind of like to get some additional information on this, on um, what we're actually, what the, what they're providing, what the productivity is. I know in previous discussions, I, and uh, I can answer. That. Wait, yep. who is who is on the the line? Turn on your camera. <laughs> oh, can you turn your camera? On? Okay. Well, uh, let me finish my, my statement. Is that in, in previous discussions? You know, we talked about um, some of these subsidies that have been asked for, and some of these developments and cost per unit. And what we're actually getting for the taxpayers' money, so I, I would I, I'm going to start looking at these items a lot with a lot more scrutiny, and I'm going to have something in new business to talk a little bit about this as well. So I mean I'm, I, you know, if, if uh, fellow council members are willing to go ahead and go with this with consent, you know, I'll I'll, I'll do you want to continue it? Is that what you're proposing? Yeah, I, I, I let Miss Travis, Travis yeah. can possibly answer. Not really. Sure. Miss Travis. Yes, good morning, Council. Can you see me? My camera's on. No, not yet. The CTTV is going to bring it bring it up in a second. There you go. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, good morning, Council. I'm Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity. Um, so there was a comment in public comment this morning, and I appreciate you guys referring to staff to get accurate information. Um, the Salidas House, the reason this is on Council's agenda, Council approved our annual action plan. That's our annual housing plan that shows how we fund all of our programs. You approve that annual action plan already. And in that plan, it states that Salido's house will be funded for three years. What's happening in this contract is just extending that agreement for one additional year. So it like aligns with the annual action plan that you have already approved. Also, there was information that was provided through public comment and not provided to you by staff. And the Salidas House from with City of Tampa funding 
in 2021 closed on 24 homes. In 2022, they closed on 14 homes. In 2023, they closed on another 14 homes. And in 2024, our current year, um, they've already closed on two years. Um, so they've closed on an, over 54, on 54 houses just with city funding. So Leaders House receives funding from other programs. And so I appreciate you not having re knee jerk reactions to just public comments and allowing staff to provide you facts. Thank you. So when you say close, they, they, they provided counseling services to the, to the. Counseling. Yes, yes, counseling services to. So when you have um, homeowners that are getting city funding, we require them to go through housing counseling um, and those services were provided and those homes were ultimately closed on. Um, the, we have um, new homeowners, if you will, 54 houses were provided through Salida's house closing counseling services. Okay, and how about items 49 reach? Um, I think this one is another alignment. Um, if you if you allow me, if you just take this off, I, I'm coming to you for administrative update. Yeah, I can I'm sorry. I'm sorry to ambush that. you like this. It's just it was no, because, no, because it was highlighted in public that. comment. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to bring something up in new business, which will I think will ask for an accounting for some a, a lot of these items, because I'm lost at the amount of money we're spending on a lot of these items and, and what we're actually getting for that return on the investment. So. Um, do you want to hold these items until she comes up with administrative may, may, I finish, may I just say something to that? The other thing that um, to be considered, when you say that you're lost at all the funding that's being used, a lot of this fund is, is CDBG housing funds. We report on this on a quarterly basis. Right. I am coming to you under administrative update um, to actually set that quarterly update. There is a reporting on this. And so I would be happy to talk to you about what other additional reporting you would like and if you just if you would just not vote on this right now and add administrative update i could provide you the background on it because i don't want to misspeak i want to make sure oh, that's I'm good no I, right. I appreciate it and thank you so much for what you do thank you mr travis Absolutely. so we'll, Absolutely. i'll talk to you soon. we'll hold 48 and 49 uh oh, until she comes back yeah that would that'd be update. great thank so you so move um 41 through 47. we have a motion from council member carlson second council member Miranda. all in favor aye, aye. aye. And I move items 50 through 54. Second. We have a motion from Council Member um, Clendenin, second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Um, can I get a motion to move, set? Uh, for petition for the review hearing to be scheduled on March 7th on 20, I mean 55 at uh, 2024, March 7th at 10 a.m. on 55 and on uh, 56 on March 7th, 2024, 10 a.m. also. We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda, second from? From? Second. From Councilmember Clendenin, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Council, it's 12.06. Would you like to break for lunch or would you like to do second reading? I like that. All right, we're going to break for lunch and come back at 1.15. Is that sufficient? On what day? Today. Today. <laughs> I, I, I got to make sure now because everything's by the hour here. All right. We are in recess until 1.15. All right. Bye-bye.